Today we are going to investigate perhaps what is at the core uh, of the entire uh, set of lectures for these two weeks. We've seen that people are not maybe essentially or not primarily and certainly not only driven by the response to economic incentives. In other words, contrary to the simplest model you could think of, the goal of people is not always to consume more, to make more money. They have much more richer goal and, uh, and desire and dreams in their life. Of course, by introspection, that seems obvious. Uh, but it is something that perhaps we have taken a little bit of time to recognize in our analysis of the economy and therefore of policies. But then once I have told you that, look, it's not just money that matters to people, then I need to tell you what it is that they are motivated by and where this comes from. This is really essential because without that, how do you understand, how do we understand how to make policies for climate change, how to make policies for social redistribution, how to make policies against discrimination, if we don't understand what makes people tick, what makes people move. So what we are going to talk uh, about um, in the coming uh, lectures is about uh, preferences, is about where they come from, whether they are strongly held or relatively shallow, uh, whether they are formed in the social networks and whether they are affected by what is around us. So this is a, a, a set of lectures that we uh, have entitled Likes, Wants and Needs. What do we like? What do we want? What do we need? Uh, and we are going to be talking about some of the core issues that are in our face all the time. Social networks, political polarization, discrimination, police violence, um, Facebook and its role in the election, uh, whether or not there is structural racism and what it means, whether there is casteism in a country like India and what it means, and so on and so forth. So this is hard to think about a set of topics that is more essential to understand the, the type of uh, world we live on. Now, as, I, uh, well, as we already discussed, this is perhaps not historically uh, what economics was known for, to study this type of issues. Uh, in fact, uh, economics is a field that just demographically, as a matter of fact, uh, is dominated by white men. And maybe white men are not the most interested in, uh, in discussing uh, discrimination and preferences. Uh, so around uh, uh, last uh, year, uh, we are just uh, um, at the anniversary, two days after the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd that has uh, unleashed a movement of, uh, of uh, um, racial justice protests in the US and everywhere in the world. And in the wake of it, a, a, a reckoning of a situation uh, of racism and discrimination that in particular black Americans face. And that black Americans were probably keenly aware of, but maybe white Americans not as much. Or maybe white people all over the world not as much. And in the wake of that, there were a lot of discussions and, uh, uh, about whether various fields, and in par particular economics, do enough both to accommodate people from different uh, backgrounds in the profession and also to accommodate different topics. So there was an article of, in the Wall Street Journal of all places uh, which is not known for its uh, uh, left-wing radicalism usually, making the point that uh, economics journals, uh, so these are the professional journals in which economists write their paper and publish their papers, do not do enough, do not publish enough about discrimination. I felt slightly personally uh, uh, attacked by this because I happen to be the editor of one of the economics journals, and actually we do publish a fair amount of work on racism and discrimination. And generally, there is actually a lot of work on these issues in the economics profession. But as usual, it is a little bit uh, quiet. And it's not the one that is the most discussed. So it's a good thing uh, to spend some time and uh, uh, take stock of what we know, what we don't know, and why there might have been historically a legitimate bias against doing studies on this type of topic. So once again, it comes back to our uh, friends, uh, the godfathers of a lot of traditional neoclassical economics, uh, the, the Chicago School. And in particular, uh, Gary Becker, 
uh, this uh, man on this picture, very uh, famous economist, Nobel Prize winners, one of the most uh, established figures in the profession, uh, who wrote an article uh, with George Stigler called De Gustibus Non Est Disputandum. Uh, in French, that would translate des goûts et des couleurs on discute pas. In English, uh, there is no accounting for taste. So what do they mean by titling a, a, a paper by this, by this article? Not so much maybe that, uh, uh, that they can't be, a, you know, that everything is legitimate, but more that it is not the, the, uh, the place or the role of economists to discuss where, com where taste comes from. They are not, they are a product of, you know, deep uh, forces, uh, they are given to us, they are very strongly held, and we cannot easily change them. So this is almost in contrast to Pierre Bourdieu, the French sociologist, who wrote an article who, was, who had almost the same title, and had a sentence saying, yes, we don't dispute them, not because all of the tastes are in nature, but more strongly because we feel as individuals entitled to our taste as if they were coming from nature. But in fact, Bourdieu went on to say, they are not, they are the product of our social environment, but they are so ingrained in our habits, uh, what uh, Bourdieu called the habitus, which is something that we are used to uh, live, it is correspond to our lived experience on a day-to-day basis, that we forget that they are the product of our history, of our social environment, and also of more subtle clues that are around in the environment. So what Becker and Stickler basically t said in this article is that we are going to forget about that. We are going to take preferences as they are. We are going to assume that they are uh, coherent and stable. What does coherent mean? That makes sense. That if people say that they prefer something to something else, that's a real statement that we need to take seriously. And stable means they are not uh, easy to change. Uh, we, can't, we can affect people's behavior by changing the incentive that they face, by changing the price system, uh, by changing social pressure of behaving one way or the other. But that's not by affecting their preferences, just by affecting the reward structure associated to a particular behavior. So for Becker and Stigler, and this proved to be enormously influential, there was this idea of let's not try to account for taste. Let's take the test as given and try to see whether it can rationalize people's different behavior, including the fact that people will tend to all do the same thing, like teenagers all want to wear their hair in the same way at a given point in time, or the fact that we can observe discrimination and racism in everyday life. Let's try to account for that without, try to, uh, without accounting for the test. So what I'm going to, to do now is to try to see how far that takes us. How much can we push <laughs> this argument? What can it account for? And you're going to see that we can go pretty far, but that eventually it's going to break down. Reality is going to kick and it's going to force us to say, look, we have to go beyond uh, that idea. We have to take the taste and preferences, not just at something that we take as given and then we then integrate in a social environment, but also as the product of the social environment and therefore as something that, number one, that economists we can explain, so that's the positive question. Number two, more importantly, as policymakers, we can potentially affect and therefore that's the normative question, which is once we recognize that taste and preferences are in fact the product of the social environment, how does the social environment need to be structured in order to make sure that those tastes and preferences are, are, uh, allow us to live in society and in the world in a way that is uh, uh, humane and, 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 and works for the common good. So that's our plan uh, for, the coming, uh, for the coming lectures. So let's start with the idea of coherence. Uh, so one way of sort of say, um, uh, uh, re-expressing coherence in a, in a layman's way is to say, well, people know what they want. People are reasonable. When they tell you that they want something, we have to assume that they want it. 
And there is something attractive about taking people seriously when they tell you something. In particular, as a development economist, uh, there is something attractive about uh, not taking people for um, idiots, to say it in so many words. A lot of, uh, in particular, a lot of aid uh, is a little bit patronizing. For example, a lot of aid was historically, although this is changing, and this has changed during the coronavirus crisis, this is slowly changing, a lot of aid from rich countries is given to poor countries in the form of uh, stuff, uh, in particular in the form of food. Now in some situation, food is what people need. For example, in the middle of a huge drought or a huge flood, there is absolutely nothing to be eaten, then you know, we need to bring the food somehow. But in most cases, we, need assist we give assistance, we being uh, either the, the foreign power that gives some aid, sometimes also the governments that provide uh, um, social support to their own poor population. They give it in the form of food, not because food is otherwise not available, but because they think that it's the only way to ensure that this money is spent in the form of food. And it goes with it that people might do something else with it which is less legitimate. In other words, we give the, the assistance in the form of food uh, out of some form of paternalism that we are thinking that we just know better than people what they should, uh, what they should want. Now, uh, um, a few years ago, several years ago now, uh, I uh, was in Morocco and met uh, a man uh, in a very, very poor region of Morocco. And we were uh, doing some qualitative work in preparation for a, a cash transfer program that was going to be put in place by the government, uh, which was um, a cash transfer program to help poor families and also to encourage them to send their kids to school. So we were discussing with this man and um, um, we were asking him, you know, if, we, if you did receive money, what would you do with it? And he said, oh, I would buy food with it. So that seems a very good idea. And I said, if you have more money, what would you do with it? And he said, I would buy more food with it. Um, and so I, I thought to myself, but this is a very poor man. He's really has, he's so poor that he has nothing to eat. And then we, he, he, he let me into his house. And in his house, he had a, um, a TV and a recorder and also an antenna for uh, watching television. So I thought, wow, this is a very poor man and he has television. So then I asked him, well, you said you were very poor and you have nothing to eat, but yet you have a television and all the equipment. And he told me, but television is much more important than food. Now, we had the rest of the conversation and he explained to me why it was the case, why it makes sense, and explained that this is a village where there is very little to do most of the time. Uh, he, he eats enough to, to survive, he's not, you know, this, this food is neither great testing not sufficient, but there is enough for it. But otherwise life is super boring. So the television is kind of the source of uh, a little bit of joy and entertainment for, uh, for people, for him, his family and people around him. Well, you can agree or disagree about the order of priorities, but what is clear is that it was his order of priorities. If we think that he was telling us the right thing, so some people might have believed, well, it's just wrong. He bought this television on an instinct, on an impulse, uh, and then once we give him more money, he's going to buy something else on an impulse. So instead of giving money, we should really rather give the food directly to make sure that it's spent in terms of food. But if it were the case, then what we would see is that when, in fact, we give money to, to people, uh, we give money to people, they spend it in other ways. If he is right, then what we should see is that even among, among very, very poor people, the elasticity of food consumption with respect to any transfer should be very high. In other words, people should spend most of the money that is given to them, to the extra expenditure that it affords them, in the form of food, because the other things that were uh, important to them, they've already gotten. And so it turns out that in the last few years, there, there has been a shift away uh, from systematically uh, giving people food. Like you can see that the vast majority on the graph on the right, that the, the vast majority of social assistance program, in, in this case in 100 low and middle income country, was food. 
and much less likely to be given uh, an, an unconditional cash transfer, which is the second less, less likely. But there has been a move, the, move away from that. And this move away from that was controversial enough that it generated a lot of evaluation where people just tried things out. One of the evaluation is the evaluation of a program called Give Directly, uh, which was uh, done in Kenya and one, one of the first programs to take seriously the idea that we should just give money to people, when, to even very poor people. And they used the uh, electronic uh, wallet on people's cell phone to transfer money to them. And that, they did that in the form of, uh, as part of a randomized control trial. So they had people randomly selected to either get this transfer or, get, or, or, or not get the transfers. They also had various versions of the transfers, uh, which uh, s it was given either to uh, men or to women, it was either monthly or in one time, and it was either a small or a large one. Now, what you can see uh, uh, towards at the last row of the, uh, in the last row of the table is that when people get the transfer, they spend about 35 uh, Kenyan shilling more uh, in total, okay? And then what you can see in the first row is that of this 35 shilling, a lot of this money is being spent on, uh, on food. And in particular, the proportional increase in food consumption, which is about 20%, is ab about as large as the proportional in, uh, increase in total expenditure consumption. In other words, proportionally, it's about one for one, that if I increase my expenditure by 1%, I increase my food consumption by about 1%. This is made both of, uh, uh, this is, uh, um, there is a composition effect, people buy better food, they're more likely to buy meat, they're more likely to, and they increase particularly, they, increase, they, they are more likely to buy better quality food. But this is the main thing, which is, this is exactly like the prediction that Usha Mark was giving us, which is, given his preferences, we should expect that when people, even people whose share of food in budget is not that large, that when people get extra money, they are going to devote the extra money to food. And this is what we're finding here. More generally, uh, the IFPRI, International Food Policy Research Institute, uh, conducted a number of experiments where they are comparing giving people food or directly versus giving people cash. And what they find across all of these experiments is that unless you are find yourself in uh, very remote places where it's just super hard to find food. In which case, when you give people cash, they beat up the price of food and they don't manage to buy that much. But unless you find yourself in this situation, which is really only in very remote places in very difficult famine conditions, when you give people cash, they spend the same amount of food as when you give people food. Uh, and therefore, it is actually turns out, uh, just as a policy point of view, as an aside, it's much more efficient to give people cash because it's much cheaper to give people cash than to give people food. You don't have to procure it, you don't have to transport it, it doesn't get wasted, it doesn't get stolen, it's easier to administer and to control. So as a policy perspective, taking into, a, you know, being, be, trusting people a little bit that they know what's good for themselves turns out to, to be not only, I think, respectful of them, but also uh, efficient and fair. So this is uh, uh, all that to say, in a sense, that uh, uh, I'm willing to go a fair, amount, a fair part of the way with Baker and Stigler uh, in knowing that people, when they express, express their uh, opinions, are fairly coherent. And in fact, I'll go back to to this idea of coherence later uh, will we'll show that even in, uh, in the midst of otherwise some not particularly rational behavior, that coherence, that people, uh, um, people's preferences make sense for their own point of view, and they act uh, rationally in, uh, in, uh, in accordance to those preferences, uh, seems to be first order uh, um, acceptable uh, um, point of departure. However, there is a question of whether uh, uh, preferences are stable. So what do they mean by stable? They mean that they are not, the preferences themselves are not influenced by others. They are not influenced by advertisements. They are not influenced by what your friends do on Facebook. They are not influenced by what you're seeing around you. 
So that seems a little bit harder to, 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 to swallow. Uh, in particular, if you say that to all of the advertising industry, they are going to be puzzled. Uh, it also seems to be a little bit hard to reconcile with the fact that we are seeing people herding together. A herd, a herd of, of sheep, you know, we think people often behaving like a herd of sheep. They kind of all do the same thing. So how is herd behavior of this kind uh, compatible with stable preferences? Isn't it the fact that I get swayed by what my friends do when I do the same thing as them? In other words, uh, so in order to answer these questions, we can also ask the question, why do people follow other people? when they are waiting uh, on a train platform? Why is it the case that you, you get little uh, uh, crowds of people waiting for the train? If you are in the Parisian metro, you see that some, sometimes tra little crowd of people waiting uh, at a specific place for the train. And then the train comes and in fact the door is about uh, two meters away from where people are actually standing. So why did people have the idea for, to, to stand there all together? Another less fascist example of the same thing, which we can think about it in the same way, is how do people all agree uh, in a particular community or in a particular sub-community on Facebook, for example, that the election was stolen? So can we think about the belief that the election of 2020 was stolen and that uh, President Trump had really won the election, which he didn't? Uh, is it, uh, can we think about it in the same way as uh, uh, where people decide to wait for the train. So it turns out uh, that it is possible to rationalize people's group behavior that way in the context of coherent and stable preferences. And in fact, Abhijit wrote one of the uh, seminal papers that, estab that establishes that. So let me kind of walk you through the logic of how we explain that. Suppose that, for example, we have this train example. And then in your, you know, at your leisure, you can do the same thing for the stolen election example, and it will work just the same way. So suppose, th suppose that you are uh, uh, considering where to wait for the train, and you have some experience. You've done it before, so you know that it's likely to be, uh, uh, the door are likely to open right uh, in front of this location. But then you arrive and you see other people already, let's say one person, and they are sitting a meter or standing a meter from where you thought that the train would stop. So you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, I have this vague idea that the train should stop here, but that person is there. They must know something I don't. So if you're not too sure, you might as well go with them. So now it's two of you. So the next person arrives. And he was pretty sure that the train stopped here. But he sees two persons waiting there. So he must be thinking there are two of them. They must, really be, they must really know something. So let me go with them. That seems like the right way to, the right thing to do. Now it's three of them. The next person comes along. They might have a signal. They might not have a signal. But they see three people. So at this point, you know, you're just going to go with the flow. You suppose that yeah, they must know something. I don't know. And so that uh, uh, crowd sort of reinforces people. The more it reinforces, the more people will ignore their own information. And eventually, uh, uh, you have uh, uh, everybody ignore their own information. And you have an informational cascade. And potentially, everybody waits for the wrong place. It didn't have to happen. It could have been different because the, 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 the second person to come could have been pretty sure that they have the right information and could have decided not to follow the first one. But one can see that it really depends of, on, on some chance, which is the strength of the prior of the second person who shows up and the third person who shows up. And therefore, we can easily have informational cascade in this way. And note that nothing about this model in, involves uh, preferences that are not entirely coherent and entirely stable. It's just that we are just, uh, we, we tend to trust what we are seeing around. So that's uh, informational cascade that is consistent with fully rational behavior. Now we do see informational cascades online. Uh, this is of course uh, 
a, a big phenomenon with the, the spread of, of fake news. We are, uh, we are going to continue talking, talking about it for quite some time now. But here is an example of an information cascade that was engineered. So these are researchers at MIT, led by Sinel Aral, a colleague in the Sloan School. Uh, they, took, uh, uh, they, they looked at a website that submits comments on particular SOPs, for example. Or, uh, they took 100,000 comments, and users on this uh, site have the opportunity to provide an upvote or a downvote for the comment, upvote or downvote, your thumbs up, thumbs down, or nothing. What they did in this work is that they gave uh, they chose randomly some of the comments that had been given and provided them with a single upvote or a single downvote or nothing. Right? So what happens? If you give a single upvote the, in the first uh, rectangle here, you can see what happens immediately after. So the place that got a downvote immediately gets an upvote. Presumably, the person who had put the comment was upset to see that someone had downvoted their comment, so they put an upvote, right? So this is what you see in that blue one, which is if you were downvoted, you get upvoted immediately after. However, if you get upvoted, nobody is there to say, no, 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 I'm going to, like, uh, you know, unless you have an enemy on the internet, nobody is there to, to downvote you. Um, on the contrary, some people see an upvote and saying, oh, I'll have a look, I'm also put an upvote. So you're kind of likely to get an upvote. Uh, if you got a first upvote, you're likely to get a second one. Now, if you look at downvoted, nobody compensated for, for the downvotes. So you're not more likely to get a downvote if you got a first downvote or if you got a first uh, upvote. So this is a second graph. So from the get-go, a single downvote is compensated and we're back to normal. But a single upvote is amplified. And that's the, what we're seeing exactly, which is with the, the same example as with the waiting for the train. Is that if you see one person waiting for the train, it's likely that someone is going to go wait for the train. And over time, this single, up, this, this single upvote gets, you know, other people just congregate toward that single upvote so that the, the, the one comment that got one single upvote out of thousands and thousands and thousands of, of, of comments is at the end of the day 25% higher rating for the comments than if they, didn't, if they weren't chosen randomly. So at the beginning you, take a, you choose uh, um, comments completely randomly on the site. In this sea of comments you add one vote. In the sea of comments and votes, you had one vote. And after uh, five months, they have a 25% higher rating. So that shows how this informational cascade exists. This is something completely uh, innocent. This is, doesn't really matter. But the same thing happens, of course, with uh, news that suddenly get uh, amplified, become viral, and circulate in the entire network. And you can see that it doesn't require people to be do not think about it. Uh, it. It can be the result of completely uh, rational uh, aggregation of what you know and what you think other people know. But you, you might think, okay, fine, I understand that. Sometimes people will ignore their own information. I can stop, I can stop here and take some questions before we, uh, we move to the next, um, uh, to the next, next topic. There's one question. Um, Ashwin is saying that sometimes people think that aid is used to purchase things like alcohol, leading to greater issues such as domestic violence. And he's thinking that maybe this depends on the region where you are delivering this aid. So should aid differ from region to region or context to context? And then the second person is asking, how can policymakers bring behavior change insights from the advertising industry into policy? Uh, great, great question. So the, on the first one, uh, that's a good question. It could depend from context to context. Um, there have now been a number of these studies delivering cash to people, uh, either completely unconditionally or conditionally on some behavior, like sending kids to school or, uh, or uh, immunization, but by and large, ended, ending up giving people cash. 
and it is has been it is a pretty general result that we don't see a huge amount of this money of really uh, none of this money being spent on alcohol or things like that so the money is generally well spent the results on uh, domestic violence are more mixed uh, in some cases you see a decrease in domestic violence following uh, cash transfer programs which are usually targeted towards women in some cases you see a decrease in domestic violence presumably because the women are empowered in some cases you see an increase in domestic violence uh, maybe because someone is trying to get you know the, their husband or partners are trying to get the money out of them and in many cases you find nothing in particular uh, and uh, so, so this is more uh, perhaps context depend dependent the idea of domestic violence and perhaps needs to be uh, it also depends on the on on the special um, on the special uh, design of the program. On the uh, advertising, uh, absolutely, the, the uh, policymakers can and start to uh, take uh, some clues from the advertising industry about how to affect behavior. But you see that it is difficult to do that if you're starting from the point of view that people's preferences are so strong that they can't be affected at all. So once we start realizing that in fact they might be, uh, that uh, allows us to, to, to take those insights. In the, for example, um, in the, the designs of campaigns to get people vaccinated against coronavirus, some of the ideas of the advertising industries have come, have come in to try and design uh, campaigns that are uh, you know, targeted adequately and, 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 and push the right button. And then there are two questions on the herd behavior that you described. The first one is how can we understand when the majority is right and when they are wrong? And the second one is how does herd behavior connect with the social norm literature? So the person wants to know a bit how this is treated in different literatures such as economics versus sociology and psychology. Are they somewhat parallel or do they use different concepts? Uh, let me take this question, but something happened to the, to the slide. Yes, there we, there we go. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is really one place, the understanding of preferences, where there is a really useful convergence of lots of literature, in particular economics and sociology, um, eco psychology, economics, and, and sociology. So in the, in the rest, in across these few, few lectures that we are going to do that we are going to to, to have on preferences you're going to see uh, uh, I'm going to of course focus on the economics literature but you're going to see how the economics literature is seizing on the insights that are coming from psychology and, 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 and sociology and trying to embed it into uh, and into our in, into their own work so this is really a place where uh, we have uh, the, a very, very rich interplay between those, those different uh, literature. And, and the other question was, how can we know uh, when the majority is right and when are they wrong? Uh, I think that depends on, on the definition of right and wrong. So that's the thing with the train, for example, if you arrive after seeing a crowd on a in a place you have no, uh, you have no way of knowing, even if you have your own signal. In the sense, you might think that your signal says something else, but you have no way of knowing that maybe they had uh, better information that told them where the train was. So that's the sad thing with, or well, the, the terrible thing with hard behavior is that it's actually for someone who is fully informed might be the rational thing to do to completely ignore their information. So this shows the importance about uh, dispelling myths by giving people, uh, by, by putting the information out uh, in a way that is uh, quite definitive in some sense, uh, that can go against, uh, you know, that, can, that, that people can incorporate on top of what they see around them. Uh, because in many circumstances, when you see a crowd moving in a place, you have no way of knowing whether they might be correct. It's not because a crowd goes somewhere that they are wrong. They could also be right. So, but another way that we see people, sometimes we see people behave all in the same way, uh, not because uh, they have information. So if you take, uh, you know, young uh, uh, kids deciding to get a, a, a tattoo, for example, they all, if, if everybody in a class gets a tattoo, 
uh, in the same place of the same uh, type of design. It can't be that they think they have information about what they should like that, uh, that they don't have. So if I see that my classmates all get a tattoo and I decide to get one, it's not because they have information about my own desire to get a tattoo. It can't be. So there is group behavior, group uh, contagion that has nothing to do with informational spillovers and informational cascades. And that has much more to do with social pressure. So the question there again is, OK, can we try and understand that in the context of stable and coherent preferences? Or do we have to necessarily conclude that um, people just get themselves influenced in terms of what they liked by mimetism, by seeing other people around them? And here, uh, uh, the work of Elena Ostrom uh, become, uh, becomes very relevant. So what she studied are a small community that um, communities uh, um, in Switzerland or in fishermen in, uh, in, in, in Nepal, uh, fish, uh, uh, sorry, uh, fishermen in uh, farmers in Nepal, people in Sw farmers in Switzerland, small communities that um, managed to govern themselves without formal institution or government. And what she pointed out is the importance of social norms. So for example, here you see a photo of a beast in Switzerland. That's a canal, uh, a canal irrigation uh, system in the mountain. It requires a lot of maintenance, and you also shouldn't you know, overuse the water. And the question she was asking is, how do they manage to uh, agree to maintain the beast system and to not overuse it such that it continues to stay in activity, even though no one is, uh, there is no formal fine if you don't, uh, if you don't respect the beast system, etc. So, uh, so she pointed out that there, there are in those communities a strong social norms. So it is really frowned upon to not uh, uh, respect the system and to overuse it, for example. And similarly, in communities in India, for example, you have uh, communities that manage to maintain the forest. And in fact, there is some work by Somanathan showing that when this, this community can do better, than a formal government system with formal fines. So the social norm might be better and stronger about enforcing, for example, not cutting branches, etc., than, than, than a government coming out with a rigid system of fines. So how can it be then that the community manages to impose these norms? So here it could be that you really would like to take out the wood in order to burn it in your kitchen. Or you really would like to have your cows eat all of the grass, or you really would like to use a lot of water from the bees and to not, uh, to not maintain the system, but you don't because you, you fear punishment. So how does it work? Well, this is like um, uh, what's, uh, um, an illustration of what people in economics call the folk theorem. Uh, call, it's called the folk theorem because it's something that people have long believed should be true before they were able to prove it. So it was kind of a folk wisdom and then it became actually correct wisdom. The folk theorem is uh, a start from something that you again could learn in Economics 101, the equivalent of supply and demand uh, graph, napkin economics, but for game theory, which is called the prisoner's dilemma. So you have it uh, illustrated here on the right side. Uh, the prisoner dilemma, think about situation where it would be advantageous to collaborate for the both of us if we both collaborated, but it is always advantageous to defect from an individual to not collaborate from an individual point of view. So for example, in the case of the, the grass, uh, if I have cows, uh, it is uh, efficient for all of us to, to not have the cows eat too much grass. On the other hand, if everybody else is not having their cows eating too much grass, then it's, a good, it's the right thing for me privately to say, well, I'll let my cow eat. So I'll let my cow eat the grass. So there is, even though for the common good, we should all behave in an appropriate way, there is always a tendency of not doing it uh, for yourself. So the prisoner dilemma illustrates that. It's a story of two prisoners, uh, two thieves. Uh, they did something together. They did a, a, a bad action together. They are caught and they are put individual in, in, in separate cells so where they cannot communicate. 
And um, the structure is that so they're interviewed separately and they know that if they both deny, they will be let off. If they both, um, if they both um, accuse the other guys, they both will go to, they both will go to prison. But if one of them uh, uh, denies everything and the other uh, 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 confesses, then that person will be let us with a, with a lighter sentence. Conversely, if one person, oh, yeah, so, so, so that's it, we are now the, the entire thing. So then clearly what would make sense, and if they could communicate what would make sense, is that they should both deny blankly. Then they, they will be able to get uh, to, to be freed. But what's going to happen is that I'm going to think, well, I, I mean, it is in the cell. Suppose he, uh, he, suppose he actually uh, uh, confesses to the crime. And I don't, then I'm screwed. Well, or suppose that he does not, but then I suppose that he denies, but I accept, then I will be actually better off. So in both circumstances, whatever he does, Privately, I'll be better off uh, uh, denying everything. Um, partly, I will be better off kind of acknowledging responsibility. So in that case, uh, what is going to happen? I'm going to betray. And on the other hand, he's going to betray. So even though if we had, so because we are both going to betray, we are both going to go to jail. So even though if we could have communicated, we would have wanted to both deny everything flatly, but in the absence of communicating, it's so much in our private interest to deny, to, to confess that we are going to confess. So this, that's the prisoner's dilemma. Something we keep encountering in life, for example, uh, if everybody wears masks around me, then uh, if I don't wear a mask, I'm not going to get sick because everyone is wearing a mask. So it's always in my advantage to not wear a mask. If no, I guess it doesn't work the other way because if nobody is wearing a mask, I should, uh, I should wear one. But so because it's always in the advantage to not wear your mask probably when other people do it, we need the government to enforce the mask mandate. Okay, so that's the prisoner's dilemma. But this is only if you play once. Now suppose that in a community we keep encountering this, uh, this situation where we have to make decisions about whether we cooperate or whether we each go in our selfish way. And that cooperation is advantage for the community. And the community has ways to really punish people who, uh, uh, who at some point don't decide to cooperate. For example, by excluding them. So for example, suppose that we've always decided that we're going to maintain our canal irrigation system really nicely. So it's great. It's much better than going, striking out on your own away from the system. So then the community can say, look, if you don't behave, if you don't cooperate, you're going to be kicked out and you're going to lose all these advantages. So if we're in that world, then everybody cooperates. So this is how a community can decide without any uh, formal fine or, informal or, 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 or enforcement to, uh, to continuously collab collaborate simply with the fear of exclusion. So that's good, and economists have uh, uh, documented, after Elinor Ström, a lot of uh, examples of these good aspects of communities. For example, in village economies, you see people um, um, insuring each other. So when someone faces a shock, their, uh, you know, their animal dies or their harvest fails, uh, they can draw upon the support of the community to sustain themselves for the difficult period. And conversely, uh, when they do well, they will contribute to other people who are not doing well that way. So there is this uh, system of informal insurance that everybody uh, uh, participates in that's potentially um, sustained by this threat of exclusion that if you don't behave, then if you don't participate once you, when you're doing well, then you're not going to be helped when you're doing poorly. So people feel that it's, it is in their advantage to participate. So that's uh, the great uh, aspect of the community, of being able, via this type of uh, uh, social norm, uh, uh, around a particular cooperative behavior, ensuring cooperation. But there is a bad aspect to that, which is nothing says the community is going to 
necessarily end up on a good outcome. For example, they could all agree that a particular group of people in the community is untouchable and shouldn't be uh, um, allowed to do anything. And that equilibrium can be sustained just the same way. Because if I belong to the favorable group and, if I'm, and I try to help them, then I could be cast out of my own group and be part of the favorable group, so I'm not going to do it. So the community can be a, a source of uh, uh, good behavior and solidarity, as well as of parochialism and, uh, and, and bad treatment, uh, and you know, where you know, emerges uh, strong uh, in-group in preferences, behavior, you, you work better with your, you only do things for your own little community, etc. You are uh, uh, nasty to black people in, in a rural village in the US, or you are nasty to untouchable in a rural village in India, very similar type of phenomenon where perhaps nobody individually would like to do it, but the community somehow has converged on that equilibrium and it's too costly to not do it. So that's kind of the good and bad and the ugly of the community, is that the fact that you converge on a particular social norm doesn't mean it's a useful one. Or it could be a, a kind of a silly one or it could be a nefarious one. Hence this like, huge tension that exists in uh, communities, in our thinking of communities such as village or caste groups or you know solidarity groups, uh, uh, clubs, etc., in, in in high school or in or in uh, or in universities, between this uh, ability to bend together to provide good things and this ability to bend together to provide bad things and in particular to provide exclusion, that tension was very apparent in the debate between uh, Gandhi and Ambedkar in, the, uh, in India around the independence movement. Um, uh, Gandhi you will know, Ambedkar you might not. Ambedkar was uh, an untouchable and a remarkable individual. He was born very poor, uh, uh, untouchable in a village in India. And despite that, he was so brilliant that he was allowed to go to the school, but he had to sit out, he had to stand outside the school where, uh, where when the teacher was teaching. Uh, so he was listening to what was going on. Uh, he was so good that eventually he got some scholarship to get educated. He eventually got two PhDs. And he uh, had a fierce debate with Gandhi on this question. So Gandhi loved villages. Uh, Gandhi thought the village was kind of the source. Uh, the, uh, he had this famous quote that the future of India lies in its villages. This is, first of all, he believed in like uh, self, uh, um, as um, uh, we discussed at the end of the lecture on trade, he believed that uh, villages should be self-sufficient and people should, you know, uh, to their own cotton and, and the like. He was kind of uh, in favor of a complete, very local, ultra-local uh, life. Uh, and also that he sort of the, the, the village as the basic unit of solidarity that should exist. And against that, Ambedkar, who had own experience of being shunned in those villages, they, they uh, described the village as a, a sink of localism, a den of ignorance, um, and narrow-mindedness and communalism. It is perhaps not incidental that Ambedkar was from a low caste and Gandhi was from a high caste. They definitely had a different experience uh, of the village, of the village life. Even though Gandhi was, of course, completely opposed to uh, uh, to, to the practice of caste and untouchability. So they had this fight. Uh, eventually, however, Gandhi gave Ambedkar the responsibility of writing the Constitution of India, and therefore Ambedkar would put in in the Constitution of India, a lot of guarantees uh, meant to protect the untouchable minority against oppression uh, by the uh, village majority. The problem when you have things done, when everything is done at the level of the community is that the strong group, which is usually the, the it can be the, the, the majority or it can just be the stronger group, is in a position to impose their uh, their, their norms on the, on the weaker groups, whereas at the level of the nation, the weaker group can be organized in a force that allows to, uh, to compensate that. 
So that was the idea of Ambedkar, that you needed a strong uh, federal government and, strong and, and, and a constitution that allowed to, to do that. And in fact, uh, the um, uh, caste uh, uh, has not vanished uh, from India, uh, despite uh, uh, Gandhi's hope that it would one day happen. Uh, caste continues to profoundly affect uh, politics. So this idea that you belong to a group and that the group is uh, a determinant for your fortune continues to be there today. So this is a cartoon that uh, uh, illustrates that nicely. So uh, cast your vote here, come and vote here, uh, is uh, re replaced by uh, vote your caste here, which illustrates the fact that, in fact, over time, more and more, uh, as the Congress Party, which was uh, independent, the Independence Party, which was uh, open to all castes, as the influence of the Congress Party is waning, uh, you have, in fact, more and more and more votes by, by castes. Uh, so, for example, there is a huge rise of the BJP, which is the high caste uh, party, the, the party that explicitly represents the interests of Hindus, and in particular of Hindu high castes. And you can see over time, a more vote for the BJP on the graph on the top, and in particular, more vote for the BJP, uh, a huge increase in the vote for the BJP in the Brahmin category, with about 60% of Brahmin voting for the BJP in the last, uh, in the 2014 election. And also a good fraction, uh, about a half, of the other forward caste, which is the other advantage caste. Another way to see that, uh, this is data for, uh, uh, the second graph is data for Uttar Pradesh, uh, looking at this time the lower caste. So what you can see is that if you, uh, comp if you look at 1980 and you compare the chance that someone who is not from a lower caste to be elected as the representative of that village. In 1980 it was very high, most representatives was, were not lower castes and it was similar regardless of the makeup of the population in the village, 72%, 80%. Now, what happened between 1980 and 1996 is a, rise of, um, is a rise of lower caste politicians. But that rise of lower caste politicians happens where, where there is a majority of lower caste people. Such that by 1996, in places that are dominated quantitatively by lower caste uh, um, uh, population, the chance that the politician is, is, uh, is uh, not lower caste is below half. On the other hand, in places where there are uh, not a majority of lower caste, the chance is still very high. So you now have a, 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 the, the lower caste uh, constituencies and the non-lower caste constituency moving in opposite direction, uh, with more and more with um, with more votes to uh, with a concentration of the vote towards the non-lower caste in the places that are not dominated by lower caste, in co and conversely. Uh, in the places that are dominated by lower caste. So you have the, the U, the UP politics being dominated by uh, more and more by caste politics. And one of the thing, one of the consequences of that is that the politician can afford being of lower and lower and lower quality because in any case, they are going to be supported by their group no matter what. And, devi and again, going back to this idea of social norm, deviating from the norm of voting for the guy from your own caste is not, uh, is not something that is easy to do. So you get, at the same time as you have a rise of caste votes in Uttar Pradesh, you also have a rise of criminalization of politics with a large number of politicians actually campaigning and running from prison. So let me stop here to, oh, let me do one more slide and then stop for question. So before we move on from the idea of caste in India and going back to sort of think about this uh, conversation between Ambedkar and, uh, and Gandhi, uh, where, who was correct in the sense, have castes, uh, we already seen that castes are still important in politics, are they important still in everyday life? Uh, so was Gandhi right that they would eventually be uh, erased by the effort of living communally in villages, or was Ambedkar right that uh, the, the, the villages would actually be, uh, uh, would not be a place to, um, to erase the importance of castes? And what we're seeing is progress and persistence. <laughs> so on the progress side, uh, we're seeing over time uh, convergence in wages across castes. So uh, between uh, the, the 80s and today, 
Uh, the difference in, in, in the wages of someone from a low caste versus someone from a high caste went from 35% disadvantage to 29% disadvantage. So th that might seem not that giant, but in fact it's better than the progress done by African American in the US at the same time. So there was some progress, which you can see illustrated in the graphs, where the, 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 the distribution of wages for lower caste starts looking more like the distribution of wages for upper caste over time. And this is due in part to affirmative action, reservation of jobs, and reservation of university position for higher caste. So this is due to the kind of policies that Ambed Ambedkar enshrined in the, population, in, the, in the Constitution. So in the Constitution of India, affirmative action is not only legal, but it's really encouraged. There is uh, affirmative action towards lower caste at all levels, uh, in politics, in uh, university job, in employment, etc. However, you continue to see a persistence of caste as a, a category of exclusion in the villages that he was complaining about. In particular, in a recent survey of uh, about um, uh, 565 villages in India, uh, in 11 Indian states, they found that untouchability were still very much practiced. So about, about half of Dalits, that is the former uh, uh, untouchable, could not sell milk. So still a very strong restriction of the, what they can touch. In 35% of the villages, they, didn't, they were just not allowed to sell in the local markets. In a, quart, in, in a third, they, they had to use separate utensils in restaurants. And in a third, they had no access to irrigation for their field. So this is showing how, this is today, so this is showing how village India, uh, in village India, caste continues to play a fundamental role in everyday lives. Sometimes that we, uh, maybe, something that we maybe forget in, uh, in, in our uh, um, perception of India as a you know, modern power full of software engineers, which is true as well, but that localism is still there with us. Um, and these castes uh, uh, and caste groups uh, continue to play a role precisely in enforcing the social norm. So this is a, a cartoon that illustrates the role of Cap Panchayat, which has the, the, the caste councils in India. There have been a lot of gender-based violence in India in the last many years, with uh, a very um, gruesome examples and well-publicized examples of rape. And one member of a Cap Panchayat said that maybe it's, be, it's due to the fact that people eat too much uh, 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 chow mein, uh, that is uh, Chinese food and that if people ate less Chinese food, this problem would disappear. So this is their view, the view of the traditional caste uh, panchet, about how they can deal with gender-based violence in villages. And that shows how uh, there is still a lot of, uh, of um, progress to be made. So let me stop here for question, and then we are going to move to, to the US. Um. Yes, so first we have questions on the social norms. So one person is asking, uh, has it been possible to change a social norm from the outside? A government attempting to enforce, for instance, a mask mandate is often seen as an interference and could worsen the resistance to masks. And on the other hand, someone else is asking the opposite question, which is, can social norms change internally or does it always need an external support? So I think both of these things can happen. <laughs> which is, that's why we are going to, that's what we are going to, to go through now. If, if social norms were the product of very strong preferences or very strong community enforcement, then they would be very hard to change. And it would be, uh, they would not change easily internally, and they would not change easily under an external pressure. Uh, but if, uh, in fact, uh, they, uh, they are more, uh, the, you know, the, the random equilibrium on which some, a community kind of decides to converge, then you know, it's like a sunspot. You can be in that sunspot, but you can move to another sunspot. And that can happen both as a result of uh, some external environment. It doesn't have to be a huge, uh, uh, ex extraordinarily paternalistic movement that is going to be backfiring, because if people don't feel that strongly about where they ended up, then maybe they are not that, easy, th that difficult to move either. Uh, or it could happen internally for the same reason, because again, it's not that people were thinking that strongly that it happens. So there are examples of that, for a, a positive, both on the positive and negative side. For example, there is a very nice paper 
uh, by Rob Townsend looking at different villages in Thailand and about the norms of being nice to your neighbors when they are helpful, when, when they have a problem. And he shows that you have some villages that are quite close to each other and some villages are uh, very, uh, have a very helpful uh, environment. All of the institution of uh, collective helps are functioning. And the villages not far from it has completely collapsed. Uh, people are not helping old people. People are not, when someone has a bad harvest, they are left to, to starve. No one helps each other. So you get this like two very different, two very similar villages with very different outcome. And he tries to understand what, what provokes that. And what he shows is that it's something small is sufficient. For example, one is closer to the road, a little bit closer. So when the city started to grow, then people started moving and they had a more attractive outside option. So suddenly the threat of being kicked out of the community was not that bad. And then therefore some people started to leave. Other people, if you are in a community and you are working towards the common good, but you see other people not participating, this is becomes less valuable. So you decide that you're going to defect too. And so everybody, it, it unravels quickly and everybody defects. So even a small change can, can put a shift to the equilibrium. Another thing that is worth uh, emphasizing is that people do not necessarily know what the social norm is. So sometimes there is a social norm that is enforced because everybody thinks that that is the social norm. So there can also be misinformation of what the social norm happens to be. So that makes social norm or behavior more persistent than actually collective beliefs. So there is a very nice paper that shows that in Saudi Arabia where they, um, they interview men about their view of women working outside of the home. And they find that actually a, a majority of people would be quite uh, uh, favorable to having their wife work outside the home. But they also ask them, what do you think other people think of your wife working outside the home? And, in, and most people think that other people would not like it. So what they do in this paper is that to half of them they're saying, but you know what, 80% of people think like you that it would be okay. And then they trace what happens over time in the group that was informed that the social norm is actually more liberal than they thought, and in the group that is still believing that the old social norm is going on. And what they find is that the group that is informed that the social norm is more liberal than they thought, the wives are actually more likely to apply for a job and to take the job and so on and so forth. So what makes, uh, so in that sense, it is, is an outside intervention, but very mild. It is not telling people, you should uh, let your wife work, this is so important. This is just saying, by the way, this is actually okay. Your neighbors would be fine with it. So that's an example of uh, sort of it's internal and external, which is the internal movement had happened, but there was, uh, people needed to know where the sun pot had moved. Um, and then we have two broader questions. So the first one is, uh, as an economist, what is your take on the reservation system in India in the, uh, today, in the 21st century? And then one other person is asking, uh, coming back to what you said about uh, our cities of, um, and cash and food transfers, uh, the person is asking what are the ethical challenges on, uh, involved in those types of our cities in terms of who would or wouldn't receive the transfers? Especially, um, so uh, at what point does research make it uh, okay, basically, to um, do an RCT and not give the program to everyone? Um, so on the on the first um, on the first question, so I very briefly alluded to it, but the system of reservation affirmative action in India definitely has contributed to the faster progress than would otherwise have been possible uh, for lower caste. So on balance, if you look at the history of India, I think that it has, been, um, it has been very beneficial. We are going to talk a bit more about affirmative action in general and the difficulty. The fact that India kind of stuck with that program has really contributed into a relative improvement of the position of the lower caste, uh, which I think is, uh, it's only uh, justified in an environment where before there was reservation going the other way. 
It's if you if you live in a if you come from a system where historically there were reservations, but for the upper caste, then it seems fair to me that we would have reservation for some time at least to allow uh, people to, to allow groups that have been historically disadvantaged for decades to catch up. On the question of the RCT for uh, for social for social transfer, uh, so the question is always uh, uh, what's the alternative? So you never end up denying uh, a, a transfer to someone that would otherwise have gotten it. Uh, what happens in the RCT is that you are giving a transfer to someone that would not have gotten it. So you add uh, to uh, the existing uh, to the existing situ status quo. You, so you improve over the existing status quo. And the truth is that the world is full of those inequities and you know. Some people get a program because they happen to be in the right town. Some people don't. So the, the world is full of uh, um, uh, differential treatment of that form. Uh, the advantage of doing it in the, in the context of an RCT is that you can then do the evaluation. And once you know, for example, in this case, that cash transfer is beneficial, that contributes to move the conversation towards having more cash transfer. So as a result of this single give directly experiment that I mentioned today, Many, 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 many millions of people get cash transfer that they would not otherwise have gotten. So the, 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 uh, that's the, the, the gain that comes as a, as a result of this. So this is kind of what... Uh, um, there is very little loss that comes from it because in, in, on the contrary, you give something to someone who would not have gotten it. And often the, the need to do an RCT forces you to do a program that would be larger than it would otherwise have been. So if anything, that improves uh, the status quo for more people. And in addition, the result allows you to, uh, to, to scale it up uh, much more uh, widely than it would otherwise have been if it turns out to be a factor. There is a follow-up question on the Saudi Arabia paper that you mentioned. Somebody would like to know whether we can trust people's answers when asked their political preferences in an authoritarian mm. state? Right, so this is a more general question which, is, uh, which refers to this uh, basically uh, social desirability bias, which is maybe people tell you what they think you'd like to hear. Uh, so that, that often is the case, that, that's often a concern in experiments, uh, and that can be even more of a concern in an authoritarian state. So here, what you can do is to hope that this is done very privately, the information is not, sh is not shared, at least at an individual level, so you can hope that people uh, tell you more or less what they think, but they might, not, they might not have. But what is interesting is that they didn't react to what you tell them about others, so they took it sufficiently seriously that they actually took some real action in the direction of going towards what they think the new social norm is. So, uh, in, in particular, they let wives sign up for jobs and actually take the jobs outside the home instead of inside. So we are seeing a real behavior that goes with the, with the, with the experiment, not just something self-reported that could be manipulated, for example, due to fear or simply because they want to be nice to you and tell you what they think you want to hear. Okay, so now we are going to, we've spent some time talking about castes in India. Now uh, 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 let's uh, talk a bit about uh, racism. And bigotry, I hope, because I also want to talk about anti-immigrant sentiment uh, in the US. So the pandemic has really put racial inequality into focus uh, in a way that if it was not clear, it's clearer now. Um, conditional on age, uh, uh, during the first year of the pandemic, uh, blacks were four times as likely to die from COVID-19 in the US as white, which is really uh, uh, um, a phenomenal number once you stop to think about it. And it's only the kind of the emerged part of the iceberg of what you would call a world of discrimination. Uh, black kids go to war schools, uh, um, um, they are less likely to go to good universities, uh, they are less likely to find good jobs, and on balance, uh, they are less likely to, to be upwardly mobile compared to their parents. So this is a graph that looks at the probability that a kid born in the in different quintile of the world distribution ends up in, 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 in the different quintile. So for example, it tells you that 
Um, the, the, a, a person who is uh, born in the poorest, a white person, a white kid who is born in the poorest quintile is about 10% uh, less likely to end up in the richest quintile than it would be than by chance, than a 25% uh, uh, equal opportunity. So definitely if you're poor, you're less likely to end, to end that your children end up rich uh, than if you are born rich, where it's about, you're about 20% uh, more likely to end up rich than would be by random chance. So that's for whites. But now if we look at the blacks, uh, they are 20% less likely than by random chance to end up to, end, to, to be rich, to, that their parents, um, if a kid is born poor, is 20% less likely than chance to be born rich. So we go from 10% to 20%. So there is less upward mobility for black children and for white children. And there is already less upward mobility for white children in the US than for Europeans. So this is a situation, a society that's not mobile anyways, and this, this not mobile society, uh, this is even less for the blacks. Uh, you can, similarly, a, a kid who is born poor is 10% more likely to, uh, than chance to stay poor if uh, he or she is white, and about 20% if she of, uh, is she of the, he or she is uh, black. So that's the first point, that uh, there is more white upward mobility than black up upward mobility. And symmetrically, uh, if you're a white kid born from a rich, uh, in a rich background, so uh, you are very, very likely, much more likely than chance, about 20% more, 20 more likely than chance to stay rich. But if you're black, you're actually not even more likely than chance, than chance to stay rich. So there is also more downward mobility. So being black is uh, a, a, a lowers your chance to succeed in life at all uh, angles. You know, even being black and born in a wealthy, relatively wealthy environment is not protected. So this is saying uh, how, uh, this is emphasizing how uh, uh, discriminatory on the basis, not just on class, but also race, the US society is today. And that's related to a number of factors. One of them is, is the schools that we discussed before. Um, one of them is the labor market, where there is discrimination uh, uh, for, towards a black in the labor market at all levels. This was uh, made particularly famous by a study by uh, uh, Sandil Mullinet and Marianne Bertrand that uh, sent CVs uh, to a um, prospective employer with uh, a black sounding name like Lakisha, for example, or white sounding name like Emily, for example. And they sent those CVs uh, to various employers and they, uh, they had a phone number, so they were waiting to be called back. That's the only thing they could do because the, C the CVs were fake, so they can't have the actual interview. But what you can see is that the probability to be called back for white name is about 10%. The probability to be called back for a, a black name, black sounding name, is, about, is less than 7%. So that's a difference of more than 3%. Uh, or a ratio of 50%. You're 50% more likely to be called back with a white sounding name than, is a black, than, than with a black sounding name. So that's the first important thing. The second important thing is that that's not even, you're not even protected by education. If anything, the, uh, the, the, the ratio of callback of a black to white CV is, um, is less, is more defavorable for educated, uh, uh, for people who display education than for people who don't. So there is discrimination in the labor market that adds to the fact that you have less educational aspects. Black people are also much more likely to be incarcerated than uh, white people. You can see here the inmates per 100,000 US residents, uh, and you can see how it's so much uh, bigger for uh, for white and for black, it was true in 1960. I, uh, it was true in 1960. It's even more true in 2010. 
Oh, one could say, well, you know, of course you're more likely, maybe they are more likely to be incarcerated because, you know, they live in, in worse neighborhoods, they are, there is more crime, uh, they are poor, so for all of these reasons, maybe not their fault, but they are more likely to be involved in crime. So here the question that comes is, is it the case that the police treat differently uh, black people and white people? Of course, you know, on the anniversary of the, uh, of the death of George Floyd under the knee of a policeman, and uh, if we look at the list of people uh, who have died in uh, similar ways uh, in the last few years, uh, which I've put here on the, on the left to just to spend a moment uh, thinking of that, these are black people who have been killed by police in recent years. It's a bit hard to think about uh, uh, the police not treating the black people differently from the white people. So it's a bit hard to take that seriously. So we can spend just a moment thinking about that list and thinking about uh, you know, the horror that it represents and the fact that it has not stopped after uh, George Floyd's death and the uh, demonstration that, came, that, went, that went with it. And then we can ask whether there is quantitative evidence that this is uh, pervasive in people's uh, lives, that the police, for example, treats the white uh, differently from the black, and therefore that uh, driving while black is a potential cause for offense even before, uh, even before you did anything. So here is an example that's much less dramatic than the death, but uh, is uh, nonetheless quite interesting. It's showing a, uh, the example of uh, speeding tickets. So when you're speeding, if you're speeding just a bit, uh, you might not get uh, a ticket. Whereas if you're speeding a lot, you get a bigger ticket. So uh, if you are arrested by the police, they could decide to let you go by writing on a piece of paper that you were uh, 10 miles per hour above the speed limit as opposed to 11 or 12 or 13, because 10 is the threshold that uh, calls for punishment versus, uh, versus not. And what you can see is that there are some policemen who are a bunch. That is, there are some policemen who are putting people at 10 and some policemen who just don't. So if you look at the policemen in black, they are the ones who don't, then the distribution for them, the distribution of, of speeding tickets for white driver and minority driver is very, very similar. But for the policemen who are lenient, who have a tendency to accommodate, you get a huge spike of uh, the fraction of drivers who are exactly driving at 10. And that spike is much bigger for white drivers than for uh, a minority drivers. Of, co of course, it is completely inconceivable that this is due to the actual uh, uh, driving behavior, in particular because we see none of this bunching for the non uh, uh, a lenient police officer, it really comes only from the lenient police officer, so it doesn't come from the driving behavior of people, but it comes from what the policeman decides to write on the ticket. So this is of course less terrible than to assume that someone uh, is going to shoot you and shoot you before he, sh he shoots you, which, which uh, 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 people, uh, uh, which policemen claim is the reason why a lot of black people get uh, killed in, in action. Uh, but it still, you know, it shows that you're finding that basically at all, uh, in all, at all level of interaction of uh, black people with the police. Beyond the police, there is uh, also uh, a rise in hate crime. Uh, continuously over the last 10 years or so, there have been a rise in hate crime reported by the FBI in the US. And a good, a large fraction, more than half of these hate crimes are uh, due to, uh, are, are accounted for by race or ethnicity, more than the, sh the share accounted for by religion, by far. Uh, Ahmaud Arbery is someone who was killed uh, uh, just before George Floyd, and he was killed while jogging in a white neighborhood and be considered by someone who, 
you know, he was chased by, uh, by militia type people who were supposedly protecting the neighborhood. So this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, encounter and what this is referring to. So the, um, the, so you get discrimination in schools, you get discrimination in job, you get discrimination in different treatment by the police, you get, uh, and you get a rise in hate crime. And this is not just uh, African-American. Uh, this is the conversation for the last year. The conversation has mainly focused on, uh, on race because it's very important and because it, was, uh, uh, it came to the fore. But there is also a huge increase in anti-immigrant sentiment. And in fact, in a sense, uh, before uh, the pandemic, maybe the, the, um, this was more the dominant story than the, than the, um, uh, the race story. And the race story came to the forefront and to the consciousness of the vast majority of the population more recently. But of course, the fact that uh, this, this anti-immigrant sentiment and the increase in the anti-immigrant sentiment is very much there was very much responsible for the increase in, for the, for the vote for, uh, for Donald Trump, since uh, the entire campaign was about, uh, was about that. So we already discussed at length the impact of, 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 of migrants on economic uh, circumstances. But as we noted in those, in those lectures, the, the anti-immigrant sentiment is not uh, confined to just thinking about, um, thinking about their role for the, uh, on, on the economy. In fact, the anti-immigrant sentiment in practice seems to have very little to do with direct economic competition. So if you're looking at this in this map, it's a response uh, to the question of, would you say that in general, the growing number of newcomers from other countries strengthened American um, society versus uh, threatened American values? So you have the choice. The darker the, the, the state on the map, the more people think that having more migrants strengthens American society. And where is the, the map dark? It's precisely where you have lots of migrants. So people um, uh, who, are ex who have a lot of exposure to migrants, who have a lot of, a lot of experience with in California, in New York, in Florida, tend to think that migrants are good for, uh, for American society. And it's people who have no migrants in their environment who tend to think that they pose a threat to the American culture. So nearly half of residents in Wyoming, who basically have never seen a migrant, Alabama and West Virginia, believe that immigrants pose a threat to the American culture. So this idea that the fear of the other, it's really a fear of the other that you haven't seen. It's not the direct exposure to a different way of living that people are resenting. Um, it is not, it is the exact opposite to the famous uh, quote by the French president Chirac who are saying, of course, people are complaining because they are exposed to noise and odors. You're saying that's exactly the opposite, that if you're exposed to noise and odors, you are more tolerant than if you've never been and you're seeing that from far, far apart and you're trying to imagine what might be a migrant. So there is this idea that migrants do not assimilate and um, um, and for every new wave of migration, we tend to think that this wave is different and finding it harder to assimilate. But in fact, the truth is migrants assimilate fast. Economically, we've already seen that the, the migrants tend to be more upwardly mobile than the native population, but also culturally. And one clear example of that is the names they are giving to their children. So the first generation of children who come, they might have a friend, the, the parents come with their name, they are come from, coming for their country. So if you're French, you have a French, you're coming, you have a French name. And then we can look at the, the, the name that they decide to give to their children. And then we can look uh, at, the number of the, at the impact of the number of years that you have already spent in the US on the uh, foreignness of the first name you, you, you're giving. So when you arrive in a country, you're, you're from Hispanic origin, you will be, if you've arrived very recently and you just have a child, you might give them a, a Spanish name and then maybe the second child will have an American name. And in fact, this is how this, this paper by Rana Bramitsky and Leah Bustan started, by observing that uh, in their own family, Rana Bramitsky is from Israel, the first child has a, an Israeli name and the second one has an American name. 
And I kind of wanted to know whether it was true in general. And what you see is that uh, over time, the more time you spend, all of these bars is, are, are negative, which is the more time you spend in the US, the more you, uh, you give an American name to the less foreign the name sounds. Uh, this was true in uh, 1920, and this is still true today uh, in California. And the second thing that is true is that uh, the countries here are ranked by how much, uh, how foreign the name were to start with. So if you, have, if you are from a country where the name sounds really, really different, then the effect of staying longer is even stronger. So what you're trying to do is that if you're starting with very, very different name, sounding name, you're really trying to adjust as you spend more time in the US. So that within a few years, in the end, the name just sounds just as uh, American for, uh, for, uh, for, for kids than, than the kids of their, of their neighborhood. So that's just one sign, one, one perhaps anecdotal, but uh, quite revealing symptom of the fact that today, like in the past, Immigrants adapt very quickly, culturally, in terms of what they are consuming, what they are eating, etc., and even the names of their children to the society where they live. And this hasn't really changed. We were discussing earlier uh, the fact that social norm might uh, respond to uh, in intervention from outside. Uh, so one thing that, and, and, and also the fact that people are trying to guess what the social norm might be. And this is where, the, uh, in the case of anti-immigrant sentiment, the fact that there was at the top since 2016 in the US a president that was explicitly and um, unabashedly uh, anti-immigrant uh, helped people kind of accept that the social norm was that it was appropriate to be anti-immigrant. And so this paper by the same uh, author, Leo Borstein, who did the paper in Saudi Arabia about, about misperceived social norms, is now asking themselves, are people more comfortable about being uh, anti-immigrant uh, now that uh, uh, Trump is in power? than uh, if Trump was not in power. So how did they do that? Uh, they called people on the telephone and they offered them, and they asked them if they wanted to contribute to, a, to an, um, an NGO that was very much against immigrants, an anti-immigrant uh, uh, movement NGO, an anti-immigrant organization, a xenophobic anti-immigrant organization. So they asked them, would you be interested in contributing some amount of money to this? Then some people they are just asked uh, whether they want to do that. So a lot of people say no, some people say yes. And some people are asked the same thing, but they are also told someone might call you back to, uh, to, to discuss the choice and make sure that this is really your choice. So in the first condition, people think that it's an entirely anonymous thing they are doing, that they are not going to give account to anyone. And in the second condition, they know that there might be a conversation that is going to be, at least one more person is going to know what they decided. So this is a more public condition and a more private condition. So if you're worried that the social norm is that it's not okay to be anti-immigrant, but if yourself you're anti-immigrant, then you're going to be more willing to give to the anti-immigrant uh, organization when it's a private condition than it's when it's a public condition. And uh, so that's the first thing. And in fact, that's true on average. People are more willing to give to the anti-immigrant organization when they think nobody's going to know than when they think it's going to be found out. Similarly, for example, people vote more for Marine Le Pen at the presidential election, then they, when they are secretly doing it in their, in their uh, voting booth, then they admit to it when they are asked in a poll. So that's the same idea that in public, it is not considered to be an acceptable behavior to be anti-immigrant or uh, to vote for, the, for, the, for Marine Le Pen in France. So people tend to under-report uh, it. Okay, so in general, that's true. What they did in this experiment is that they did that in a, a, a county in, in, 
they, they did this study in a town uh, in, uh, where the town itself had voted for Clinton at the president 2016 election, but the overall county around it had voted for Trump. So what they could do at the beginning of the interview, truthfully, is to say, I want to remind you that everybody in your, that in, in your town, the majority of people voted for Hillary Clinton, versus I want to remind you that in the county, the majority of people voted for Trump at the 2016 election. So they basically uh, shift a little bit the perception of what is the social norm around them. And what they find is that when they reminded people that Clinton had won, uh, had won the county, you have this effect that in public people give less than in private. But when they were reminded that uh, Trump had won the overall county, that suddenly offered license to be anti-migrant, and now there is no difference anymore on the right side between the public and the private condition. So this a little bit answers the question we were discussing earlier about uh, the, uh, the influence of the outside in terms of at least you know, acting on the behavior and being concerned about what the social norm is. That the people are looking for signals of what is the right way to behave. And in the US, the fact that for four years, we had uh, someone who uh, made it entirely acceptable uh, to express anti-immigrant sentiment uh, uh, certainly contributed to the rise of, uh, 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 of both, of at least expressed anti-immigrant sentiment. So uh, let's go back to this uh, discrimination, uh, racism, this racist attitude that we are uh, s seeing in society, or the anti-immigrant sentiment, or the anti-caste immigrant, or anti-Muslim in the US, in, the, in India. In the US, there is little of that for now. Uh, can there be a, a rational explanation for that attitude? So again, remember, economists love to find rational explanation to everything within the context of uh, uh, coherent and stable preferences. So how successful have they been on this particular uh, question? So in India, uh, so sometimes it can just be uh, economically convenient uh, to, uh, to be racist or to, be, or to discriminate. And for example, in India, someone showed that uh, there are many more Hindu-Muslim riots when the Muslims are doing fairly well economically. And by chance, in the Hindu-Muslim riot, there is also a lot of uh, ransacking and pillaging of the Muslim shops. So if Muslims are doing pretty well, you know, that's a good occasion to have a little riot and put them in their place and take something along the way. So that's a you know, degree zero of economic rationale for being, uh, for being violent, which actually explains a certain amount of what's happening in, in the, in, uh, at least in some circumstances. Now, back to the community as the den of communi communalism. Remember that the social norms are fragile. Remember the Thai example that we were discussing earlier, where um, um, the, in one village, the, the social norm of helping each other had completely, comple completely unraveled. If that is the case, then the groups are really keen to enforce the uh, um, sort of a membership towards them. And one way to force people to pay a membership due in a club is to ask them to behave in a nasty way with respect to the other. So in the same way that in, in school, uh, in high school, the, the, uh, the cliques are forming in part in, in opposition to another clique, um, in society as well, uh, showing that you're really, really, really anti-Arab in Israel might be a way to show that you have your, you know, that, that, you, that you should be accepted inside your, 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 your own community. Or in, conversely, in Indonesia, when there was, uh, um, in the economic crisis, when people really needed, um, needed the help from their community, they started, you know, going to uh, um, Quranic study groups, etc., to kind of uh, um, make a display of their identity of a group. So, if you're uh, if you're a community and you're concerned about uh, showing membership, then 
both uh, sh sh loud expression of your uh, uh, your belonging to that club, which can go, which often can be uh, a way of saying that you're not belonging to another club, and therefore the other clubs are the enemies, can be a way to uh, can be a reason why uh, can be a way to show your membership, and therefore uh, we we can see as people, for example, suffer economically more in, in, in rural areas in the US, they feel it's even more important to establish that they belong. And, and the way that the community shows that they belong is by making, forcing their members to take this risky, costly action to show that we are together. So that could be, that, that would be a sort of, again, economic, rational reason for people to cluster together, to bend together, even in bad behavior. And finally, one favorite of economists is the idea of statistical discrimination, which is that if I'm a policeman and I see a black person in, in, in the community, I don't have anything personally against this black person, I assure you. But, you know, I know that uh, black people are more likely to be incarcerated, there must be a reason, therefore, in my head there is the model that this black person might be more likely to be a criminal than not, and therefore, I'm going to arrest them. So that's the idea of statistical discrimination. There might be no animus whatsoever. It's just I'm incorporating, I'm judging the individual for the group. So there is certainly evidence that st statistical discrimination does exist. Um, so I'm not negating the idea. For example, there is a nice study that um, show that um, uh, if, when you have less information, uh, statistical discrimination kicks in in exchange. In exchange. So there is, uh, in employment, uh, when you apply for a job in, uh, uh, in the US, uh, in some places, uh, in some states, it is legal to uh, have a box that says, tick here if you've ever been convicted of any offense. And therefore, you can not hire this person because you don't like to have a former convict as part of your employees. That, of course, has made it very difficult for former convicts to find jobs, and therefore it means that being convicted once uh, of a crime is sort of a punishment for life. So in some states, there are policies to, there are policies to, uh, to uh, ban the box, to make it, uh, so this is the ban the box movement, which is, it is not legal to have this box, you cannot ask. And this graph shows you uh, the probability of employment uh, pre and post band the, ba band the box in different cities. Uh, so the blue cities are the ones who have adopted the band the box policy and the red cities haven't. And what you can see is that before the band the box policies are adopted, when they are in states where they are, that's the vertical bar that says zero, the employment of black men is about the same. And after the ban the box policy, you see a huge divergence, which is in places where the ban the box policy is in place, employers simply refuse to call black men. So that's a motivating fact for this study, where what they did is that they then sent CVs again in ban the box places and in non ban the box places, and they found that the callback ratio rates are much less favorable to black in places that have a ban, to bo ban the box policy. So this is a backfiring uh, uh, impact of this well-intended policy, which is basically removing information. Then employers are like, oh, you know, there is some chance that this person has a criminal record because more people are convicted among black than among white, so I'm just not going to hire anyone who is black, that's safer. And so that's, the, that's the, uh, a, a clear example that affirmative action is at play. But it cannot possibly be all there is to it. And here I'll give you an anecdote that uh, um, someone uh, who is a director of, uh, of a charter school uh, in an uh, inner city in the US, so mainly poor country, was saying. Um, they were telling that the, the, the kids in their uh, neighborhood, in their school, keep being uh, chased by the police and frisked and asked to look for drugs. And that's very distressing for the children to keep being uh, arrested you know, uh, by police and frisked for drugs. So at some point, they had the police come to the school to have a chat, a conversation with the kids. And the first thing the police said is, look, 
we are in this high crime neighborhood, so we have to, you're a black kid, we have to assume that there might be some drugs on you, so we have to search you. So basically, statistical discrimination. Then they had a great idea, which is why don't you show, why don't you wear a huge tag on yourself that shows that you're a student in this school, then we are going to leave you alone. So basically, provide the information, prove that you are innocent to, ref, to, to, uh, uh, to avoid the, the problem. And finally, um, when kids said, oh, we keep being searched and you never, uh, you, you don't find anything. Once more, once again, you don't find anything. And the policeman replied, not this time. So basically, this not this time statement, I think, is really important because it's saying that that policeman who by the way, might, was probably black. A lot of the policemen were black in, in this meeting. But that policeman said, what, what that point was expressing is that the fact that I have information about you specifically, because I just searched you and I didn't find drug, is not sufficient to convince me of your innocence because you are so likely to be guilty because you're black that you, it, it must be that next time I'll find, you, I'll find you with the drug on you. So that shows that it can't be just statistical discrimination, because you just have the information. And the information is not, the information about the individual is not strong enough to overcome your prior. Therefore, it can't be statistical discrimination only. It has to be a stereotype uh, that goes beyond that, that is you know, unshakable. And another way to, uh, to think about this stereotype is that the stereotypes are also shared by people who, uh, uh, who, live it, who live those stereotypes themselves. Uh, but before we go that, let me stop a, a minute for question. Um, one person is asking if there is a link between economic growth and the increase in racism, uh, i.e. the less growth there is, the more racism and discrimination there would be. Um, and another person was asking when you showed the map of the US, um, uh, and so could the, the, the association between California being more open to migration, could there be an omitted variable bias in the sense that those regions are more economically well developed and so there's more immigration? Um, and the third question is, uh, uh, one person is asking how to break the vicious circle of discrimination and more specifically is Amartya Sen's approach to improving capabilities sufficient uh, to uh, break this cycle? Uh, so the first two questions are related. So I, I don't know that, uh, I, you know, I can't prove it to you just now that there is a relationship between economic, uh, uh, economic circumstances and discrimination. But um, uh, what we are going to see, and I'm definitely going to go close to that as we are progressing in the class, where uh, we are going to see that often the, the, the reaction to, it is my belief, and I think supported by a lot of evidence, that the... Um, uh, discrimination can be the result of uh, the need for a scapegoat to explain what is happening to you. And therefore, the more uh, stressed out economically people are, the more likely they are to, uh, to, to, to converge towards more, uh, towards more uh, bigoted or uh, discriminatory positions. Uh, and therefore, yes, it could well be the case that uh, in the map that I showed, it happens to be that these are the coasts who are more tolerant towards immigrants, and this is the interior that is suffering economically, that, is, uh, that, is, uh, um, that discriminates more towards migrants. I wouldn't call it an omitted bias, because it's not that I had any causal, uh, uh, that I was trying to, to show that it's, uh, it's causal that when you see more immigrants, you, became, you become more sympathetic, not with this map. However, I'm going to show you evidence of that kind a little bit further. Uh, on how to fight discrimination, I, you know, it's a, it's a great point, which is, is it sufficient to make sure that, for example, black people or low caste have the possibility to come in and play a role in society? And um, um, I, I would say probably not, because it, it has to be not only that they are capable, but that the other side also think that they are capable. So I think the two have to go together, which is there has to be enough uh, access to opportunities, uh, to the groups that were disadvantaged traditionally, as well as uh, a, a, a more openness from the group that were traditionally advantaged.
So, um, so we started as saying, you know, the stereotypes are so strong that it's difficult, for example, for this policeman to, uh, to, to, to let go of it. The stereotypes are also so strong that they end up uh, changing the perception of themselves by the group that are traditionally disadvantaged. And so this is the work by, uh, originally by Claude Steele, a psychologist, um, and, uh, and many of his collaborators. Uh, in the original research, uh, black subjects were given a test, and they were either, the test was either presented as a labo laboratory uh, problem-solving task, black subject and white subject did the same test, and black did just as well as whites. Uh, in another condition, same test, black, uh, black subjects, white subjects, but now the test was presented, presented as a test to measure your intellectual ability. And there, when they showed that, the black um, um, students or subjects did less well on the test than the white students. The interpretation is that when they, they, have so, they have incorporated in themselves the idea that they are not intellectually as uh, performant because that's so much around them. So the moment they, f they, they see a difficulty, they think, oh, it must be me. Uh, and uh, they kind of uh, stop there. Uh, similar work was done with girls in mathematics. So they took uh, students who were good at math, you know, math major or engineering major, boys and girls, and they made them uh, take a test, take a pretty difficult hard math test. And if you don't do anything in particular, girls are less likely to do well on the exam than boys. But if you, before the test, you say, you might have heard that girls are less good at math than boys, but it does not apply to this particular test. Then the difference between boys and girls is erased. So that's an example of, uh, uh, that's two examples of stereotype threat. Inversely, if you take white students and you ask them, you do, they do a math test, they do worse when they are told uh, that this test was designed to test why Asians tend to outperform whites in uh, math ability. So whites also are subject to the stereotype threat that good students are good at math. So we see that the stereotype threats are so powerful that they affect people's performance. And yet, people should have good information about themselves. So if it was just statistical discrimination, we would not. This statistical discrimination is not consistent with stereotype, with stereotype tra threat type, type results. Uh, the stereotype threats also, uh, um, the, the impact of stereotype and of this opinion that we have of other people uh, lead to self-fulfilling prophecies, which is people who are uh, discriminatory to start with are more likely to behave in ways that encourage lower performance. So there was a study, this study is from uh, France, uh, where the researchers worked with a big supermarket company and had managers uh, do what is called an implicit association test. An implicit association test is a test that was developed by uh, Mazarin Banaji and her associates at Yale. And what it does is that it asks you to classify uh, uh, words either on the left side of the screen or the right side of the screen. And you, you so first, for example, you associ associate words towards the good or bad. So sun, vacation, uh, pleasant, etc. you put on the left, and then on the right you put uh, uh, gray, uh, disease, uh, fear on the right. So this is easy to do, you can't, there's no mistake. Then you can, ask, you can be asked, for example, to group uh, uh, black and white images also on the left, an image of white people and black people also on the left and on the right. And the implicit association is measured by saying whether this task is easier for you when white and good are on the same side and black and bad are on the same side or where it, when it's reverse. So if it's easier when white and black are on the same side, then, then white and good are on the same side, then, on, then if black and good are on the same side, it shows that you have implicit bias associating white with good. So in this study, they did an implicit association test with uh, migrants' name, uh, uh, first names, and, um, and, and good. 
And they found that uh, when um, uh, interns were affected to managers that were more biased as measured by these tests, they performed less well. So they were less likely to show up on time, they did less work, they, uh, they were less likely to be promoted at the end, etc. So the bias of the employer, of the manager, goes with uh, 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 less, you know, generate endogenously a less good uh, performance by the, by, the, uh, by the intern, or in particular by the minority interns. And revealing the bias helps correct it. So this is a study from Italy that shows that uh, in general in mathematics, um, teachers give lower grades to students on math if they are migrants uh, compared to what would be predicted by their performance on a test. So you take two kids who do exactly as well when the exam is anonymous, the migrant will get lower grade in math uh, than the native, native kid. So that, that's the first result. The second result is that that's particularly true for teachers who have a strong, who, who show to be biased in one of those implicit association tests. The third result is that if you inform teachers of their own bias, this bias disappears. So this is what you see here in the, in the, uh, in, in the graph of the left, we're comparing the blue and the, and the white distribution. So in the blue, di the blue distribution is after people were giving feedback on their own graph, they give more higher grades to the students than, uh, than if they are not in form of their own bias. So teachers are bi tend to be biased. They, they grade in a biased way, but actually they can be made to reflect about this bias and correct for it, which is very good news. The, the last the thing, that, the thing that makes it very uh, um, unlikely that this is all, uh, that this is all random and uh, it, it is all statistical discrimination, it happens to be that everybody believes things went some way, is that the chips always fall the, the same way. Somehow it's never the white children who are assumed to be criminals in a particular neighborhood. It's always the black students who are assumed to be uh, uh, criminals, or it's always the black students who think they are less good at math. Uh, and um, so how come it's systematically growing in this direction? In, in another cloth steel experiment, uh, students were given some uh, uh, tasks that looked like golf. And in one experiment, uh, so they, they were so this, they were given g golf exercise. In one condition, race was primed, so they were reminded to, they were writing down their, their race. And in, when race was primed, kids did, the black kids did less well than the white kids at doing this golf exercise. But when race was not primed, they weren't. So the idea that was in their mind uh, was that uh, black kids cannot play golf. Uh, and when they were reminded of their race, they would not. Of course, this was before Tiger Wood. Tiger Wood would prove them wrong, that the black kids can play golf. In another experiment, um, uh, uh, kids were given exercises, uh, sport exercises, white and black kids, in Princeton. And the exercises were either presented as a test of natural athletic ability, in which case, as you might guess, the black kids did better, or were given as a test of sports intelligence, in which case the white kids got better. So the stereotypes are never random. The stereotype goes themselves are the product of the, the, the environment, and somehow they always work out to the disadvantage of black people. We can see here that the statistical discrimination makes no sense because it is not the case that it, it's the same task. So we can't have a statistical discrimination model that makes me think I'm worse at this task. So they have to be the product of our social experience, and they cannot be, uh, and therefore, they, 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 we have to now take that into account and, uh, and understand how these prejudices or these beliefs uh, are formed as social objects. We have to take them as objects, because it couldn't otherwise be that they, by, by chance it always ends up in this way. And in fact, the social context as a way of creeping back by what we determine to be the social norm. 
So it's a third uh, experiment by the same uh, group of people uh, uh, who work on social norms, Leonardo Borstein and his associate, which shows that the social norms are not arbitrary. So here they are looking at um, schools where uh, students are uh, disadvantaged schools and schools that they define to be smart to be cool school, uh, schools. So schools where uh, you, know, it, you shouldn't uh, work, pretend that you're working too hard. And they are again doing one of those uh, private versus public decision uh, uh, experiments. So they are offering people the chance to sign for a SAT preparation course, so a course to prepare to be ready for, uh, for going to college. Uh, they're asking that it's taking place in the classroom. And there is a small change in the form they have to fill. In one case, uh, in some classrooms, they are saying, uh, um, we might discuss your choice with the rest of the class together. And in some classrooms, they don't say that. Uh, they say, on the contrary, your choice will remain purely uh, confidential. And what you can see is that when the decision is private, uh, the people, um, when the decision is private, the, um, and you can either get, uh, when the decision is private, you're more likely to, be, uh, to, to sign up when, than when the decision is public. So it's about 80% uh, about of, of kids signed up when the decision is private, and 44 to 62% of people of, uh, of kids signed up when the, decision, when the decision was public. In addition, uh, if the, the, this was presented to be a lottery, so the chance of actually getting the SAT uh, was after you enter the lottery was 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 uh, on was um, either low or high, and people were less likely to be signing up when it was public and the probability was low because they took the chance and to have their identity as a nerd revealed in a, in exchange of in a sense fairly little benefits, so they, they just were less likely to do it. But the key thing that I want to insist on is the difference between 80% sign up when the decision is, is public and uh, 62, oh, sorry, 80% uh, sign up when the decision is private and 62 when the decision is public, even if you're almost sure to win, the, to win this very uh, worthy package. So I'm going to stop here for today. Uh, and I'm just leaving you with the picture here of Hans Fair. Uh, we are going to pick up uh, with him uh, next uh, uh, um, tomorrow. Ernst Fair is a professor in Zurich, and he wrote a very famous paper uh, titled "De Gustibus S Disputandum," which is we have to discuss where pre tester preferences are coming from, and this is what we are going to do uh, tomorrow. Welcome again. Um, I want to continue what Esther was discussing on just what we mean by preferences. Preferences are sort of like the, uh, you know, for, for most economists, it's kind of the holy grail. It's what's, what keeps us honest, it keeps us away from, uh, you know, just imposing our, our own, own views on everything. So in that sense, it's, it's sort of the rock, bedrock of, of a lot of economics. Nonetheless, I think what we've learned is that at least in the way they're articulated in behavior, uh, preferences are often quite ad hoc and arbitrary. And in, in some ways, I think there's no better illustration than this one. This is an experiment that was, um, you know, I think it's originally by Kahneman and Taylor, but was done many, has been done hundreds of times. And it's always finds the same thing, almost always finds the same thing, which is suppose you did a lottery and you give half the people uh, a mug and another half of, half of the people uh, uh, something else. And then you ask them, you know, how much money would you take to uh, give up the mug? mug uh, in each case, uh, or how much money would you pay for the mug, mug in the other case? Um, and the answer turns out, turns out to be extremely different. Those numbers should be the same on average. The populations are randomly chosen. They should say, you know, this mug is worth 
I know how much it's worth. It's worth four euros to me or five dollars or whatever, some number. Uh, but in fact, if you have won the lottery in five minutes earlier and it's now on your, you have the mug, then you turn out to be, you feel ownership and you, you, it'll cost you something like seven dollars to take it away from you. If it's not yours, if the mug is, you, you got something else, then to buy it, you'd only offer well, less than three. So it's, it's a, uh, there's an enormous difference. Just that m moment of ownership seems to make a difference. That kind of questions this idea that this is the bedrock of our uh, be uh, behavior. In some ways, it's like some solid thing that's stable, that's permanent, that's essential to us. It's just hard to believe that that could change that fast. Um, Here's an e another rather remarkable one. Uh, it's an experiment where people were asked to, um, you know, to bid for a bunch of products. The products were not the m absolutely everyday products because you know they were not. It's not something you know the price of totally. But you know, you it doesn't really shouldn't really matter that you don't. The list of the products are up there: Belgian chocolates, rare wine, etc. And you were, you, you were. Uh, there were things that you knew about. You probably had preferences over, but were not necessarily um, not were not, not necessarily things that you see every day and buy every day. So that was deliberately chosen. So and then before you bid, pe pe people uh, asked. Um, whether or not you would be willing to um, uh, buy it uh, for a price that's less than the last two digits of your social security number. So that social security numbers are like, you know, I, I guess there are 10 digit numbers and the last two digits are obviously numbers that are less than 100. So they're like, you know, some number, um, you know, 35 or for 47 or 75 and you know would you pay less than and it turned out that you would have, you would imagine you know these are people these numbers are completely randomly chosen they have nothing to do with anything there's a, a literally a lottery that determines what number you have so it should have nothing to do with your preference it should not be that you know people who have high social security numbers like wine more Turns out that your, the social security number that you have influences the w willingness to pay uh, in, a, in a rather remarkable way. So it's, it's a, in some ways, again, you know, something completely arbitrary. Uh, you have no idea what you want to pay for this. And um, you use your social security number as an anchor for, the, for that decision. And that suggests, again, that something about your preferences is not that fundamental to your essence. Here's a third, uh, uh, third experiment. Um, this was an experiment that uh, has been now repeated multiple times again. It's an experiment where people are asked, it's very peculiar in a sense, is to ask to 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 toss a coin secretly. Nobody's watching you. They're guaranteed nobody's watching you. They can see that nobody's watching them. And they're told, to just toss a coin a hundred times and tell us how many times you got, or hundred or some number of times, and tell, tell us how many times you got ahead. And as you would imagine, uh, that should be a distribution centered around 50 or 50 percent. Turns out that, uh, you know, People are not always uh, truthful. I mean, give, especially given that they're getting paid for getting, the, you know, every head is extra money. Eh, people are not necessarily always truthful. They they somewhat exaggerate the number of heads. But what's interesting is first that, you know, when for this experiment carried out in Switzerland, it was uh, you know the if people where so they brought in a bunch of bankers and uh, these were all bankers the whole sample and then some of them were just reminded of their normal life so they were normal citizens and you know they were uh, 
you know, they were primed to think about their role as a, as a citizen of a society. And then it turned out that they basically told the truth. The next thing you could, they did, the alternative thing for the other sample was to, uh, to remind them that they were bankers, their professional identity. And when that happened, it turned out very sadly that they started cheating more, significantly more. So bankers were, I guess they were primed to make money. And so they decided, no, this means I should be making money, which means this is lied. Again, these were small manipulations of their, uh, of some, you know, some guy who you don't even know who asks, tells you, look, you know, you're a banker. Why should that have any effect on your essential preferences for honesty or not? And it turns out, again, that remarkably, it has, a, it has big effects. Um, this is a very famous experiment from a long time ago. I think these days you wouldn't be allowed to do this experiment. It's a little bit, uh, and rightly, I think. A bunch of ch children were taken to uh, uh, some place called Robbers Island, which is a kind of a, like an, an adventure setting for kids. And they were divided in two groups. And then they were told to that, you know, you, are, you should think of that other group as your adversary. And so, when, and when you're told that, even though these groups are completely chosen at random, so the, just the whole population was just split in two and, you know, one group was told that you are group A, the other was group B, and they were supposed to be enemies of each other. They started doing quite awful things to each other uh, when, when that happened. Then at some point, they were told, actually, no, now you better work together because in fact we are running out of water and so you better find water sources and cooperate. And when you told them that, they started cooperating. So again, the point is, uh, you know, whether this experiment is perfectly designed or not, there might be too much priming. Uh, one could question it, but the fact that when I tell you to, that you're enemies, you act as enemies. When you're told you're, you are friends, you act as friends and act in quite morally um, questionable ways when you are uh, told your enemy suggests that again the references that we so rely on to say that you know this is good and that is bad because people want it some people want it and others don't uh, that just doesn't seem to be there it just doesn't seem we don't seem to be able to find that the solidity of the preferences that we were kind of relying on Now, that then um, I think one of the, uh, I think what, what that sort of, I think in, in the, especially in the political space, I think what that, that's partly pointing to is not just that, you know, your preferences are, um, are uh, you know, context dependent, but even what you think as objective information you know, not my preferences, but my beliefs, my, my sense of how the world works. Those things are also context dependent. And that's the idea that uh, Benabou and Tirol have, uh, Rollo Benabou and Jean Tirol, both of whom were, uh, you know, at MIT at, at some point, old friends. They, they, they have this very beautiful uh, theory of motivated beliefs. People choose their beliefs to may protect themselves from confronting aspects of reality that they find unpleasant. And that idea that, uh, you know, you may, even the objective reality uh, that you are supposed to be reacting to, that's the other kind of, um, kind of premise of a lot of economics is that there's an objective reality, people are reacting to the objective reality. That particular premise also doesn't seem to be always true. And that's really obviously related to this flexibility of beliefs, that you, of preferences. I think, I, I think this is, um, I, this too, I could go on on this, but I, I think it's some ways, I think the, what I want to flag here is that if you live in the world that this describes, a preferences are extremely context dependent. I think one of the things that that implies is that small cues drive you in very far away often. So when 
in the US when the uh, the sort of uh, potentially um, you know less you know less educated and potentially more um, people who have uh, sometimes used racist uh, rhetoric, let's say, with each other, uh, that, poten I don't want to say potential racist, because that doesn't sound like, uh, that's sort of ag against the spirit of what I want to say. So I won't, I'm not finding the right word, but it's people who, who, who have occasionally been associated with r racist ideas, let's say. When those people were described by Hillary Clinton in her uh, in the run-up to the election against Trump uh, as the deplorables, uh, even though what she was trying to say was actually, that was taken out of context, but that word was so powerful that it kind of changed the political preferences of lots of people. That's been claimed and it seems plausible because, you know, if political preferences again are founded in these small cues, the small cues matter a lot. What I, whether your social security number is 97 or 79 matters a lot, then many small cues matter. And this particular small cue of, she said that, she used that word, uh, I, I think that uh, that's the kind of thing that can have enormous impact in that world. And I, I think when we think about the political system, I think it's very important, therefore, to try to be sympathetic to the people we disagree with. Because if we don't, we will use the language that's going to then solidify these preferences. Because the pre it's not that the preferences, their preferences are, or, or, and ours, are necessarily that deep. We all often have contradictory impulses. We, we don't necessarily believe in one thing. We often believe in A and not A, and therefore, we are often liable to be pushed in different directions by the circumstances. So I think if we set up ourselves in opposition to a certain group of people, we'll end up in opposition with these people, even if it's not intended. So it's very important to be careful and, and uh, being understanding of what impulses drive people to take positions, even positions we don't like, even positions we, on which we and inclined to take the you know, moral high ground like racism or something, I think it's very important to understand what the impulse is behind. When people speak in those languages, it's worth understanding what impulses are behind it. That's, uh, the, the next point I want to make is that in all of this, there are two reinforcing factors. This fact that, as, as I said, small um, small uh, kind of cues can move you in different directions. But once though they move you, move you or reinforces that, first, uh, I think the, so the structure of social networks, and the second, the, the particular aspects of social media. And I, I want to spend a little bit of time making that connection to make the point that we are especially, uh, I think that, that makes the danger of sort of getting it wrong even more, uh, uh, even more um, salient. It's, I think we, we, we should worry more about it because once something goes uh, off kilter, it can go a long way off kilter because there is this entire uh, sort of natural forces of separation that come from the existence or the nature of social networks and the functioning of, of especially of social media. So I think it's been well documented, and this is obviously the, is that people with, who are inclined to have similar experiences are often also people for other reasons, um, I mean, not necessarily particularly deep reasons, but often for, you know, relatively uh, sort of uh, accidental reasons, turn out to be fundamental to the construction of, of uh, social networks. It's not that you necessarily need to be anti-black for white kids to be in school playing mostly 
white kids and black kids playing with black kids. Small queues, small kids in your, your if you live in your, your neighborhood, you're six years old, you live in, an, in a neighborhood where there are mostly white people, you see white people, you, you're used to playing with them, they speak a per English in a particular way, yeah, the, the words they use are different. Those small things can push you away and that's, that's been, it's called homophily and that's widely observed. Uh, and this is not, uh, I think it's key to emphasize that this is not something that's, uh, it's not because uh, the, these separations don't happen because I, I have an intention to create a white clique. It happens because I'm, I'm used to speaking in a particular, let's say English in a particular way and that, that when I speak the English in that way I hear it, the kids who speak like me, I'm, maybe I'm more willing to, to, to uh, you know, hang out with them, just not out really because some, but because, you know, I'm six years old, I don't really think very hard about these things. But then those things harden into when you're t 14, that, that turns out to be much more of a, you know, much stronger bonds because you've been growing up together and so on. So it's a, it's a, it can be, small things can lead to big consequences. Uh, for some, I mean, and a good example of this kind of homophilic bond is, is marriage in India. Uh, in, enormous uh, emphasis on, on caste. Uh, so people uh, really advertise in newspapers. The first thing they say, I want someone from uh, a, a particular caste. Now these, uh, these ads are probably m more amusing for those who of you are in America because for example the bride wanted ad in that one is a beautiful example of how Indians write English uh, a beautiful homely girl homely in American means the opposite of beautiful so beautiful homely would not make anything in uh, mean anything in American in, in Indian English it means someone who's inclined to stay at home not someone who's so um, I mean, a traditional is probably the right right translation of that. But with that, it's what the point this says is that essentially, people put a huge premium. This is from a, a study we did where we looked at, you know, where do you do you consider, you know, letters for marriage? These are arranged marriages, so quite economically motivated uh, choices. Not 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 impulsive, uh, this is not speed dating, it's the opposite, it takes a year to, to conclude one of these transactions. So it's a, it's a very, um, very thought out, economically very motivated uh, set of transactions. Even in these uh, people tend to be very, very uh, keen to stay within the same caste and I think that's, uh, that's, uh, that's important and what we show in the paper is that uh, that's partly sustained even you know you have in principle you're willing to sacrifice a lot to keep your same caste so you could be get a letter for somebody who's uh, or who's um, much wealthier but from the wrong caste and you just could reject that uh, and part of the reason you do that is it turns out that it actually in equilibrium it doesn't matter very much because even though yes I reject this person but somebody like him or her will show up in my from my own group, and so again, it's the small the benefits of um, keeping cast are actually relatively. I mean, the cost of keeping cast are relatively, relatively small. It's just you do it not because you have a very very strong passionate um, preference, but because you know everybody does it. Why would I go uh, do anything different? And that that's enough to keep it, keep it going. And then uh, what, what this often does is uh, it creates what are called echo chambers. You know, if you, the fact that you associate socially with people from your own group, that, that tends to uh, reinforce, uh, and this is the point I was making, why this is connected to this preferences issue, or beliefs or motivated beliefs. Once you have those beliefs, uh, you, you, you offer, if the people who you associate with have 
the same circumstances and therefore have the same reason to have the same beliefs, you end up in this situation where you, you, you don't get anyone to contradict you. So when you say, oh yeah, I think, you know, whatever, group X is uh, poor, but that's their own fault because they are, whatever, lazy or this or that, these kinds of uh, positions, well, you hear that from your friends also have the same, same kinds of beliefs and so, you know, you feel reinforced in them and that's, that's one of the reasons why we should worry a lot about this kind of segregation is that you see, uh, if you look at this slide, you, you see that, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who are, who, uh, liberal Democrats think uh, you know, climate change comes mostly from, from human activity um, and uh, conservative Republicans almost never believe that um, uh, is the, the most important part of the story. And this, this, this means that you get, and that's partly, I mean, why they're conservative Republicans, but it's also the case that given that the facts are you're constantly encountering a set of facts which are very much of the human intervention view. The fact that some people can hold on to that is also a result of, of this uh, echo chambers. And uh, likewise, but this has consequences for the people who were um, most vaccine hesitant also in the US are also the people, that's what that graphic shows, all the blue dots are states that voted for Biden, all the red dots are states that voted for Trump, and every red dot is essentially higher than every blue dot uh, in vaccine uh, hesitancy. So you, you, you see the fact that these people, I, I mean my friends are all Trump voters, I talk to them, and then Therefore, the, if somebody plants vaccine hesitancy among Trump voters, it'll spread to all Trump voters because Trump voters talk mostly to Trump voters. Therefore, you get, oh, have you heard there was this one case of this is somewhere which may or may not be true, but even if it were true, it might be, you know, the costs and benefits don't necessarily weighed were perfectly. You might say that, look, you know, yes, somebody got a blood clot, but that's one in a million, and you know, the chance of dying from COVID is, you know, a thousand times as big as that. So you don't have those conversations. Instead, you hear the the, the bad news. So I think that the, this is this is a, again these are all suggestive. I'm not saying that you the causal mechanism is all through the, this. I mean, sure, these people have somewhat different life experiences as well. But I think it's very important to to worry, start worrying about the fact that we we are we if small cues move us a long way, and then we only talk to each other, then the same cues. Moved, moved all of our friends and we all agree that vaccines are dangerous now. And I think that that would generate a lot of clustering. An another uh, interesting example, uh, politicians to describe the same thing, and this is again, this idea that politicians, in the case of politicians, they are using those, the cues, they are planting those cues that, so for, for people who are against estate taxes, they call them death taxes. So the Republicans now will not refer to estate taxes. Estate taxes are taxes that you pay your, before, when uh, somebody dies, the children before they're inheriting the wealth will pay for it. That's a extremely, potentially extremely valuable for redistribution, one of the fairest because it's, it has, it, it's really uh, preventing the intergenerational transmission of wealth. And yet it's much opposed, and it's much opposed because of this beautiful uh, move on the right of calling them uh, death taxes. Death taxes has awful. Uh, you're, uh, you, you know, even though it makes little sense, right? It's not tax. You know, you're not taxing death. Uh, that would be good if you could do that. But uh, it's not that we could. Uh, we are able to do that. We're taxing uh, the consequences of the transition of wealth. But in any case, the point is that here again, the politicians understand the importance of using their cues. That people's preferences again. You know, if I call it estate taxes, it normalizes. It's, if I call it debt taxes, it's scary. And therefore, 
Republicans who are against debt taxes use the, a different set of cues than the Democrats. Democrats call it uh, uh, estate taxes, which sounds normal, and Republicans call it death taxes, which sounds scary. And I think that, that particular divide is very, very, very uh, much using this, uh, this landscape where cues are going to create separation. And this has, this has changed over the last 20 years. It's a very nice paper showing that basically people are getting better and better at it. They're better and better finding cues that which, you know, will, uh, you, you describe the same thing with different words if you're Republican and if you're Democrat. You don't use the same words. This partisanship has been growing substantially over the last, uh, over the last many years. So it's, it's, it's an interesting, interesting, uh, consequence of this way of thinking. Uh, it goes with another fact, which is that in 1960, 33% of Republicans and, and Democrats thought, you know, their own party members were intelligent, 27% thought the uh, other party was intelligent. Now, it, in 2008, 62% thought their own party members were intelligent and 14% thought the other side was intelligent. So it really is a, 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 this, this separation, this fact that now we, are, we, know, we, are, we have more and more um, you know, different rhetorics and therefore different understandings of the world means we are more and more skeptical of the understanding of others because you know we we I, I hear that these guys are in favor of death taxes what kind of people could be favoring of death taxes so you know the rhetoric pulls you apart uh, and and you see exactly what you would expect now the other side of this I wanted to uh, as I said uh, is the is the media uh, how, how, do we, how do we understand the effect of the mid media? And I, I think that one of the things that uh, you have to, uh, the isolation index is a measure of the kind of media people encounter. And the first fact should surprise you a little bit, that it's, if you look at uh, news items with a liberal slant that a conservative is uh, exposed to, um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, uh, you know, as a, as a, you know, as against one that is from with your own slant, then, uh, you know, the, the, that, that, that ratio is, you know, has been high for a long time and so, and you know, so it's not the case that we are suddenly, suddenly becoming isolated. So this is this is this has been true before the internet that people mostly conservatives read conservative news and liberals read news. And liberal news was true for a long time, um, and uh, you know, the if you uh, if you. Uh, if you don't, then it's a, it's probably it's a it's a really depressing story. Mm, if you don't know of it, but many of you probably know about the f use of the r radio in Rwanda to uh, sort of encourage people to go and massacre other Rwandans. So it's like it was, the radio was literally ask, calling the other side cockroaches and saying, "Go kill the cockroaches," and it was it was uh, that particular. I mean, so you know, abuse of media is not new. I mean, as Goebbels famously uh, uh, told us that you know he, it was not that he, in 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 the uh, in the in the 1930s the, he understood the power of the of the big lie in a sense. So I, I think we, we we it's not that it's uh, we I think we we, but uh, but I think that. One, one of the things that makes, uh, I think, um, social media, so I don't want to say that the so social media is the source of all evil. I think it's, that's, that, that, it's, that's neither helpful nor true. Uh, but it's, but uh, uh, one of the things that social media does is it makes it even easier to segregate. 
because for example the idea of following is something that doesn't you can't follow um, other people if on the newspaper obviously you you can follow leader writers you can follow you know i read x but not y i read krugman but i, I uh, or i don't i never read krugman those are it's not that it's it's impossible to to segregate but but you you can the, the amount of reinforcement you can get is still much more limited because there are only so many leaders you can read and typically there will be some balance and so you will read one, you want are very conservative but maybe the next person won't be as conservative whereas now you can just choose exactly the segment you want to be in. So you can, you can follow exactly the set of people and then uh, you get their feed from everywhere so they what they say not just on this particular this particular newspaper but in that other place and what interview they gave so you can you can really focus on the particular part of the political space if you want to be in Q QAnon you can be in QAnon and never hear about reality um, so uh, yeah. uh, so it's a, so that's a so it's the, the so social media is um, is is uh, yet another way in which this sort of cl this clustering gets reinforced. You you get uh, uh, you know the it, it, even though everybody is connected at some level the you know everybody is part of the giant component people are actually even on Facebook the distance between liberals and conservatives is not that much because everybody the average path length is just 4.7 that's the distance from me to you know the average other person is 4.7 nonetheless so meaning I'm connected to someone who's connected to someone who's connected to someone who's connected to them. So it's not that far. It's still true that people can segment very effectively. So that's, the, that's again um, to say that the in internet is uh, not helping in this respect despite the original hope that you know, Facebook would become the kind of the, the replacement of the the village cafe where everybody meets and is, people, everybody don't meet. Okay, I should stop. I should have stopped earlier. Let me take some questions. There's one question on preferences. So considering what we have learned today and, and yesterday about, uh, about preferences, what does this imply for the economic, economic methods and models that heavily rely on preferences? And then related to this, to what extent is the analysis of Homophily, political rhetoric, segregation, etc., part of the study and doing of economics as opposed to other social sciences. So, on the first question, I think economics actually relies when we when we do policy analysis, especially what uh, economists call structural political uh, po policy analysis. They they essentially estimate models where preferences are part of the output of the model. We we say that we need to know how much people value you know relief from pollution and we do it by essentially looking at their behavior and saying well this behavior must imply that this is how much they value and then we assess policies based on that so if you believe that people's decisions are mostly you know driven by all kinds of impulses that are not particularly deep in them then to say that you know uh, for example, uh, there's this claim that people, uh, even when they, uh, you know, when they are given all the information, it's made very easy for them. They don't adopt, you know, power-saving measures. On the other hand, I'm not sure that that necessarily is saying something about um, how they would react if it was made automatic. It was they were given free access to power saving met methods. So you know, you, it's, it's not clear to me that people, uh, how one makes a distinction between people um, don't want to save power and people would like to save power but they forget a lot. And, uh, and, uh, they, and when they forget they're unhappy actually, but they still uh, don't do it. 
So I, and if the, in the latter world you would actually care a lot about, you would be very willing to say if you can somehow make it automatic so that I will be very happy to participate in it. I would want the power to be switched off, I just can't remember to do it. Uh, whereas if I say I really don't like switching off lights, I like my house to be you know, lighted all the time, I want the air conditioned to run even when I am not there, then that would be very different and I think we are very bad at making this, those kinds of distinctions uh, and so I think sometimes, so as a result we often take behavior and say that that reflects preferences when it often reflects some combination of preferences, our inability to implement our own preferences and everything else. Uh, on the second question, you know, I, I, I think economics is a, is a discipline on how we, how, what we take seriously in, in when we look at uh, ideas. Is that every, this is, it's not that sociology and economics are asking radically different questions. They are asking very similar questions. They just, sociology em emphasizes certain types of evidence, certain types of relationships, those, relation, those kinds of uh, th certain kinds of theories therefore based on those relationships. And it's not that we as economists we think that those are uh, all wrong. We think but we, we are specialized to understand certain types of behavior, behaviors that can be channeled into uh, through which are observed through individual uh, reactions rather than group reactions for example and therefore we uh, the, the way we collect data is different with the way we interpret that data is different that doesn't necessarily mean that we are we, we just good at some things and we should continue to do those things and when we analyze uh, social media we do it through the lens of an economist uh, focusing on individual decision making not necessarily the rhetoric how the rhetoric functions the rhetoric, how the rhetoric functions could be something that the sociologist would be better at understanding so it's not it's not we, we're asking it's not that the we are displacing them, we are just using our tools in this context to the extent that they can be used. Sanjana is asking, how can the feedback loops of partisanship and echo chambers be interrupted and it, whether it is fair to put the emotional labor of empathy on the disadvantaged? So I. Uh, uh, it's an excellent question. I mean, how can it be interrupted? I'll talk about it a little bit. Let me uh, come back to that. Uh, on the, the emotional, uh, I think that I, 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 the disadvantaged are, are often more empathetic than I. I, I think empathy. I don't. I don't feel. I think in some ways we are uh, the the. I think one of the worst aspects of. Um, the individualist capitalist cultures we often in inhabit is precisely that they drain us of empathy. They are to rationalize the lack of empathy. So I, I don't think that, uh, I don't particularly feel that we have, so I, 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 the thought is a very interesting one. I don't have a answer to whether or not it's harder to be empathetic necessarily, but I, I think it's more the direction of empathy that's, uh, it's not that you know, the people living in, um, you know, Appalachia in the U.S., very poor uh, whites who are now very angry, are necessarily less empathetic towards each other. I, I think that's a, that may be, that's a different claim. I think the, the, it's not clear that to me that, for example, your circumstances drain your empathy necessarily. Maybe they actually give create more value to empathy rather than other things. So I, I, don't, I, I, I think one could easily, there's an interest, very interesting set of thoughts. Uh, it, I, I can think of situations where it's true, I can think of situations where it's not true. I don't, I certainly think that if you look at the kind of literature on, on uh, social insurance in villages, it's remarkable how good the insurance is. That's, that's always, you know, you, you, the striking thing is how, how little consumption of people vary when their incomes vary. They get someone to help them. Now, is that empathy? Is it, is it just, you know, rational cooperation? I don't know. But it's certainly not the case that uh, you, 
you, I think the people, very poor people in villages are, are actually better at helping each other than um, middle class people re living in a big city. Uh, in many ways, the, you know, your neighbor, you may not even know who your neighbor is. Whereas in a village, if somebody is actually starving, you probably help them out a little. So I, 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 that, I don't know whether what, how to interpret that, but my guess is there, there is, no, you know, it's not clear that the uh, that the socially advantaged have a monopoly of empathy. I, I hope not, and I don't think it's true. Okay, uh, so I think several things have been happening that makes, uh, I just want to revisit this question of, uh, of what, you know, what can, what can we do? Is there something, is there some, some, uh, some, some place where uh, we can intervene? And I think, I think the, I think that requires first thinking a little bit about the nature of uh, nature of our our relationship to to social media now. And I asked, let me start a little bit with that. So one of the things that social media has done is um, because a lot of you know, it's a, it's the dominance of retweeting and re rehashing news that other people have produced means that. The space for kind of hardcore investigative journalism has gone down. And you can see that the newsrooms are shrinking. That's partly because a lot of the social media just takes news from elsewhere and posts it. So it's, they don't even bother to, to edit it. So it's, it, it means that you get, you, you get, uh, Lot, a lot of uh, you, you get a lot of um, uh, you know you, the the news that you get tends to be less some separate pieces of maybe information on the same thing and more the same story often slightly exaggerated sent back but really not investigated so you know the people who you, the two things that happen in any journalist thing. One is you, you have somebody finds a fact and the other is people reinterpret the fact. And there's a lot more interpretation than there is of and of pa just passing on with a comment, this is cool, this is, this is, this proves what I said about the Democrats or this proves what I say about this group or that group of, you know, uh, so it's a lot more approvals and a lot less of original investigation and that that of course contributes to the to this world of fake news there's just um, in the 2016 election 115 pro trump fake news stories were shared 31 million times so you people kept getting the same same story rather than you know different pieces of evidence on the same issue so there were the same very few stories very many views and i think that that's something that uh, social media facilitates. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that it does is it makes customization uh, of you, what you read much easier. You, you, you can decide the, in fact, you can, you can decide what you're going to read, but mostly social media decides what you read. It looks at what you're looking at. I, I, it's not accidental that I, I, because I'm interested in food, I get Tons and tons of feed. My Google feed is dominated by food, uh, even though some of it, you know, I, I don't actually. I would rather know more about what's happening in Africa, but it's uh, b often than than those. But it's uh, you know, they they have now learned that I am interested in food stories, and I open them, and so they keep sending them, and I don't know even know how to knock that off. So it's I, th I think that. Um, they, they, you know, the peep, now, peep, the fact that people, uh, the automatic feeds have a, a particularly, uh, you know, they sort of pick up fairly coarse cues. And so if you read, I mean, when I open one uh, story on Fox News or other, some right, other right wing source, I get 200. 
immediately. They are looking for uh, they are looking for people uh, who are going to are experimenting with the right wing news. So you get a lot. So it's it's very mechanical and responsive. Yeah, in a sense, well, and I think there's some evidence by one of our ex-students showing that, um, at least in Korea, uh, when people get to choose the media source, they actually choose media sources that are, you know, not very different from where they are, but precisely for that reason, they trust the info, they look for information then, they're not for affirmation. And therefore, they actually become more moderate as a result because they actually are willing to say, look, you know, if this paper has published it, it's probably not left-wing trash or right-wing nonsense. It's probably relatively reliable. So when they actually, the information is more moderate, they move in a moderate direction. And so in a sense, choice is people, giving people more control would be better. People have too little control right now. The, the whole media structure is designed around the idea that, if, uh, you know, I'm going to just have a, a bot checking on what you are reading and give you what you, they, the bot thinks you do reading. And I think actually, in fact, the consequences of that is that it, you end up with less, uh, you get less uh, moderating influences that you might. Um, more generally, so I think that we can, I think regulating social media is, has to be a part of this story. I, I think we have so little understanding of what can be done in that context, other than while preserving independence. Right now, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of countries uh, where, uh, for example, Twitter and um, is uh, is being challenged and the independence is being challenged and I think there's a real debate about, there about you know how, you know how how you pre preserve individual freedom and individuals ability to choose what the information they get while uh, you know removing the the kind of the mechanical uh, models that which in some ways Twitter claims is you know, this way I'm, I'm not, no, I'm not manipulating what you're reading. It's just you are controlling it. And, but in fact, the control is very, very limited in that sense. And in that case, especially Twitter is less of an example of that. There are others where that's really a huge issue. Um, okay. Now, there's a, going beyond, uh, maybe I stop here for a minute and then I, I take the last 10 minutes to make one last point. So there was one question, but I think you actually just answered, but maybe you want to expand a bit on this. So the person is asking, what are your views on government intervention in social media to control uh, fake news? And he's referring to the recent events with um, that have had to uh, platforms that had to comply with IT rules in India, actually. So maybe besides, uh, besides. Uh, so, uh, so I think that the tension is is uh, I think uh, how do you how do you uh, limit access to you know by uh, people uh, who controls who has access to it. So what what counts as fake news? The question isn't whether. We, social media should be, um, you know, should not be vigilant about fake news, but who decides what's fake? And I think there, I think the, we really need a regulatory structure which doesn't exist. To say that the government decides what's fake is an extremely uh, strange position to take because, of course, the government has its own views on what's, what, what's safe and what's not. So I, I think one needs to, I think this is a conversation we really need to have, which is, you know, I, I don't disagree that there should be regulation, but the regulatory structures need to be somehow put outside the reach of the government in that case, or, or we will lose, uh, lose our ability to, to keep, so the, somehow the judiciary and other institutions will have to provide some balance. Um, let me, let me, um, uh, to end, let me talk a little bit about, uh, I think, a broader uh, social agenda, which is that 
uh, I think it's in, we mentioned sociology before, in sociology is often called the contact hypothesis. The idea that one of the reasons why you have so much separation is actually physically you don't meet people who are of a different kind. You just don't know, know them and therefore empath empathy is somehow related to physical contact. And because you're in a physical contact, you don't have empathy and that, that then drives a certain uh, type of, uh, you know, closeness uh, in view. So one of the interesting, uh, there's a set of studies which look at where basically what happens if your roommate who's often allocated a lottery happens to be from a different race and you ch certainly change your views towards uh, uh, race. This is, um, this is from... Mm, uh, a study in India by Gautam Rao, a beautiful study in a school, there were different classrooms, some were treated and some were not, and in those classrooms, uh, kids were, uh, I, there were two things that were done, one was kids were associated, put into t r relay race teams with other kids, sometimes of kids of their own own uh, social class and sometimes kids from other social classes. Poor and rich kids were put in the same. And to see if that, and especially some of the times there were like prizes for those things. So there was an even more stronger reason to, to pick the best. And that ra raised, that made people more willing to associate with people they wouldn't normally associate with and change people's preferences in the, in the longer run. Um, this is another study by one of our students uh, and it, it, it makes a slightly more elaborate point which is that especially important that when you, like the relay race is a good example, in the relay race you, you really have to be, a, you know, you, you need to work together. Uh, that's a really that's the ideal example of coordination. It's very important. Uh, so what this what the this other study shows is that if you if you are uh, playing cricket, this famous famously Indo-British game, uh, which uh, you you have to. There's a team that you're playing against and a team you're in. If you're in your own team, uh, people from other castes, then you actually become more cooperative. If you are playing against people from the other caste, then that, so, I mean, in general, participating in this cricket games, in this experiment, Im improve people's r relations with other castes on average. But relative to the improvement, if you are competing against them, then you, that makes you feel less positive. So again, uh, people's contact is good and especially cooperative contact is good. Um, and, uh, you know, I, to finish, let me say one last, I describe you one last set of facts. So I think where, where does this leave us? I mean, that's, as I said, this, this picture, Many of you might have seen, which is uh, the man con in, inside the Congress uh, carrying, a, carrying a, a Confederate flag. This is January 6th when you know uh, Biden's elections were being certified. This was a, this was a, I mean as ma as clear a declaration of the allegiances of a lot of the anti-Biden people as you can. Uh, as you can imagine. Uh, so is it hopeless? Is it just that there are two groups, they hate each other, they're, you know, and we see the mechanisms for that. The, you know, the social media people are choosing to read what they want to read, which is often the same kind of thing that makes them then uh, continue to believe what they believe, etc., etc. They mix with the same kinds of people, they live in the same places where the other people are also also have the same kinds of preferences, they hear the same stories. So is, is it, so here's a fact that may, should, might make you a little more optimistic. So this is a study we did, which was, um, which was uh, during the current pandemic and it was, it was messages from a set of doctors, black and white, uh, who we randomly sent to a random set of uh, many, 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 many thousands of pa participants and 
the idea was to just give information about masks and, and other things of our safe practices. But what we varied were, you know, the identity of the doctors, the doctors could be black or white, and the identity of the recipients, the recipients could be white, black, Republican, Democrat. So all kinds of people were involved in it. And when we, 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 sent, we sent these, these, these m messages, so this is an example of one of the doctors who sent, uh, sent the message. Uh, the, these, and these doctors were mostly actually from Massachusetts, so not necessarily from Wyoming so much. So there was, there was even geographical clustering. So we were worried that we will get a lot of segmentation, that the Republicans would just ignore it. We even added like, you know, messages about, you know, Black Lives Matter and so just to see if people react to those messages, um, if some people treat that as cues to shut off the message, etc. And we find that in every dimension, both knowledge and behavior, there is the, the proportional reactions are very similar across Republicans and Democrats, whites and blacks. That they, they, you know, in general, um, Republicans are less likely to wear masks. They're less likely. So we measured their willingness to pay for masks. We were going to say, we were willing to sell them a mask and see how much they were willing to pay for it. So we have good behavioral measures of of uh, how how we, how much they like masks, and you can see that basically all the groups are roughly uh, roughly proportional terms that influence the same way by these interventions as uh, any other. It doesn't make a difference whether it comes to a Black Lives Matter message or not. They, they are willing to listen to those equally. Uh, so it, there is a sense in which the, there is even though this do it doesn't matter if your doctor, if the doctor speaking to you is black and you are white or the other way around, it seems like there is still a role for objectivity. I think people are open to it. We, partly maybe these messages were sufficiently just fact based and kind of, uh, you know, based on, look, this is just good for you, do it. Uh, style. Uh, I'm not sure we would have always worked, but what is striking is the fact that all our sort of we put in all our prejudices that you know these guys won't respond, they will hate this message, etc. We found nothing. We found everybody responds. I found response in the right direction. Even among Republicans, we see an increase in the willingness when you emphasize the fact that black people are more likely to die from COVID. There's, we see Republicans being more willing to give money to black char charities that support black people. So it, in some ways, it, the, what is the good news is, I think people, we shouldn't write off people. We shouldn't assume that because we see this segmentation, we are going to, um, going to, uh, it's all over. In some ways, there's people, as I said right at the beginning, people have, people are both believe A and not A. So the, the people in Florida, they, they overwhelmingly voted for Trump, but they also voted for the minimum wage. And by much more, many more people voted for the minimum wage than they voted for Trump. Uh, many, many more. So they were, so in some ways, uh, and the minimum, raising the minimum wage a lot. Uh, so there is support. So people, I, I think I'm, I'm, I guess I'm saying that in some ways we should take, take the, take the message that people are, uh, people have, um, have these divergent preferences, both take it seriously, but also not treat that as the end of the story. Uh, for example, we find in, in India that when we did an experiment where there was a puppet show sort of encouraging people to vote uh, based on e development issues and not on caste, we find big effects, 10% 10, 10 changes in the way whether you vote for your own caste party or not. And again, and our interpretation is not that people just listen, but, because, but that people often have defaults. They, they vote for their own caste because that's the that's the only one that they have thought of so far. So I, with that, let me with that maybe slightly optimistic note. Let me stop and take one last question, maybe, and then.
then we move to the uh, next set of lectures. Um, so there's two questions. Um, one is uh, asking whether the echo chamber phenomena, uh, phenomenon that you discussed existed before the social media era or not. And the second one is asking uh, what would be the economic policy levers that could tackle or mitigate these issues of racism beyond the information experiment that you discussed. So I, I think on the first one I would say it's less well documented but surely. I, I, I can't imagine not. I think people are always, the echo chamber has always existed in some sense. People have always uh, sort of the same story go, goes back and forth. Have you heard? Have you heard? Uh, I mean, uh, that's, uh, that I, 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 it's now of course with the internet we measure it very well because we can track a story much more effectively. So in some sense the measurement is making us associated with the internet but I'm sure that's not the case. This on the second question, I mean, it's that's an enor enormous amount of uh, of uh, material, but it's something that is, will be a big part of the last group of lectures. So let me wait on that. It's, it's the last two lectures is where we're going to talk about that.